we're just starting again. Yep. So, Welcome yeah. everyone. I'm very pleased you can join us today for this Haiku workshop. Uh, it's been a pleasure for me to, to witness all the activities that the uh, Virgilio House has done over the years and uh, it's wonderful uh, to be part of the community, especially in these pandemic times with the, uh, the um, food programs that are going on right now. And I'm, I'm happy to be part of that. There will be a food element to the workshop we have today. Um, I'm coming to you live from uh, Seattle where the sun hasn't quite set yet. We had a, a cool dryish day today, but it's been wet lately. I understand it's been raining a lot in, in Camden and around that area mm. today. <clears throat> um, I don't know if you've had a chance to go outdoors yet today, but if so, I hope uh, the fall colors have been nice there as they are here. <clears throat> So our agenda today is I have a PowerPoint show that we'll step through with some um, haiku that I'd like each of you to take turns reading. So uh, once we start that, feel free to unmute and just read if you want to and don't if you'd rather not. Um, that's fine. Um, uh, then we will, I want us to talk about the poems and um, we'll develop some thoughts on haiku targets. And I'll be asking some questions about some of the poems as we go along. And I know a couple of you may have more experience than others at haiku. So use your judgment and perhaps let those who may be less experienced uh, to perhaps let them answer the questions as we go along. Uh, but if, it, if we have uh, an awkward silence for too long, feel free to pipe up um, uh, and we'll, we'll work our way through this. Uh, it, the goal here is to learn more about haiku to uh, um, enjoy haiku as a way to express ourselves to uh, capture the moments of everyday experience um, and ultimately to share haiku. In fact, um, if any of you want a single book uh, to read about haiku, I recommend William Higginson's The Haiku Handbook. And uh, the very first paragraph of that book says that the purpose of haiku is to share them. And that's, that's really what I, that's the, uh, the bug I want you to catch is uh, to enjoy writing and sharing haiku. Uh, and then when you, when you share the poem, you're momentarily vulnerable because you're saying this matters to me and I hope it matters to you. And, and yet when somebody says, oh, I like that one, they sort of give the poem a blessing and validation. And you have this, uh, your vulnerability is, um, is validated uh, and, and you share that vulnerability, I think. And even if a poem isn't quite vulnerable, um, there's still an, an act of communication with the act of sharing it, whether you're emailing it to somebody, publishing it in a journal or a book or posting it on social media, however you're sharing something, it is, it is that sharing that I think is vital to, to the haiku art. And, and when you share, you wanna be clear. And there are also techniques that have been established for, for writing haiku well. And uh, we're gonna explore those and uh, talk about various, various aspects of haiku. So um, with that in mind, I will start with my PowerPoint. Can you see it? We can. <laughs> yes. Okay. We're going to learn about haiku, tar haiku targets here. Anybody, has anybody seen this t-shirt? All the time. <laughs> yeah, I've seen that. <laughs> I've seen that haiku. <laughs> and yes, 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 it's a funny one. Um, some people think that this is an anonymous thing. It's apparently by, actually by Rolf Nelson. Uh, in Texas, um, and it's, uh, I don't know, 15, 20 years old. Um, <coughs> is this a haiku? What do you think? No. What do the rest of you think? No. Why, why or why not? Well, some of you aren't say, sure, right? Let me say this, Michael. We, just, we got this haiku in the high school haiku contest one year, and I didn't vote for it. So that's how I know it's not a haiku. <laughs> yeah, so that was a sort of uh, plagiarism, it's, I would say. Um, and yeah. this one has been plagiarized quite a few times, um, rather publicly. Um, so this is not really a haiku. It's funny. And it succeeds as, as a short poem, for sure. We, we laugh. Um, 
but it's not a haiku. It's really a comment about haiku. Mm. Um, so it's sort of a meta haiku, I guess you could call it. But there's one thing it gets right. What do you think okay. that is? The form. Okay, explain what you mean. The way that it's um, written in, in a traditional haiku form. And what form is that? So the 575. Okay. Um, that's actually not what I was uh, trying to point out. And we'll talk um, more about form later. Something else is actually much more important that it gets right about, about haiku. It has two um, parts. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I just said that it has two parts. Okay. So, yes, that's sort of what, what, what makes this poem work, is that you have um, uh, the phrase, haikus are easy, but sometimes they don't make sense. And then you have this leap, and it's that leap that I'll call the refrigerator effect that, that this poem gets right. It shifts from one part to another. And it's this structure that is, I would say, the most important thing about haiku. Um, and in this case, the surprise of the last line uh, is humorous. Um, and the, this, in, in haiku, the, the, the effect of this refrigerator effect um, doesn't have to be humorous, but it still has to be maybe surprising or it might make you think, or it creates a mystery. What does this have to do with that? Um, <clears throat> but as you enter into the poem and think about what the two parts have to do with each other, it can actually begin to work. Um, but I will say in passing that the form here is what a lot of us were taught, but not necessarily so. We'll, we'll dive into that later. <laughs> so um, here's what I wanna cover, and we may not get to all this, we may run out of time. Um, what's a haiku, uh, some key haiku targets, where it came from, a bit of the history of haiku. Uh, we'll try a writing exercise, and I want that to be food focused. And as time allows, we can share and discuss what you, what you write. And we'll probably run out of time and not get not get to the things at the end, other related haiku arts like haiga and sinu and tanga and haibun and stuff. Um, uh, and we probably well, the advice to remember um, will just be a repeat of what we've already been talking about. And the how to become a haiku addict is just connecting with the community. And we'll we'll see if we can get to that. <laughs> if you have any questions along the way, uh, wave or just talk, um, interrupt, that's okay. Um, in, in the screen sharing view, I only see six of you at a time. So if you wave, I may not see you. Uh, so you may have to speak up, but please, please do if you have a question as we go along. I do want this to be interactive. And in fact, we're about to share some haiku and I want you to take turns reading them if you like. Uh, it's optional up to you. So <clears throat> this is it. Uh, listen to the poems. Normally I would give you a handout if we were in person and I wish we were, um, but the poems we can discuss are on the screen, so that should do. Uh, and I, as we go through the poems, I want you to think about how each poem makes you feel. That's really it, the, the feeling you get from the haiku. Really think about, about that. and Try to identify the feeling as we go. And if you wanna take notes as we go through, there's maybe half a dozen poems, um, think about that. Um, and I want you to think about which poems you like most or which poems puzzle you. And then um, share the thoughts at the end. We'll, uh, well, as we go and, and at the end, I'd like you to share your thoughts on what you think are some of the strongest characteristics of these particular poems. Um, and as it mentions at the end, these poems are from Corban and Hugel's Haiku Anthology. This is the from the third edition. Um, the one that changed my life was the second edition. Uh, and I was pleased to be part of the third edition. Uh, and I can't believe that book is already um, 21 years old now. Um, time flies. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's the first poem. If somebody would like to read this aloud. I'll go, because it's one of my favorites. The telephone rings only once, autumn rain. Why you said this is a favorite? Yes. Why? Uh, just because I guess because when it was written, telephones actually rang. <laughs> there were cell phones. We didn't have answering machines or call forwarding or caller ID or any of that stuff. 
And so this is an experience that anybody my age or around my age will remember that the telephone would ring, you would run to get it, and then nobody would be there. And you had no way of knowing that feeling of uncertainty. Was it your long lost lover calling you up? Was it an emergency or something going on with your spouse or your uh, parents or something? It was just a really odd feeling of not knowing what was what that was about. And I just think that, you know, to me, the, the it, it had to be autumn rain. It, it could, any other kind of rain would the feeling would have not been the same as autumn rain. And so, uh, this, this is one of my favorite haiku. It's one of the ones that drew me to the form way back when, when I first saw it. So I, I have a good hit rating so far today. <laughs> um, in, in, so you good. said that it has to be autumn rain. Explain that. Why? Because that's one of the questions I was going to ask about this poem. Is why does it say autumn rain? In other words, the refrigerator effect here. Autumn rain is sort of a surprise, yet it's right at the same time. What makes it right for you? Uh, just because of the feelings normally associated with fall, melancholy, um, loneliness, the, you know, the things are winding down. And uh, to me, it just seems like, uh, you know, the, the poet or the person in this poem is sitting at home alone, obviously alone. <laughs> and yeah. the phone rings and either, now I'm the kind of guy that runs to the phone when it rings. Some other people are much more laid back and maybe they let it ring a few times. So it might have a totally different effect on them. But I just remember feeling that autumn rain was the exact right season for this poem. So you you were talking about emotions, and that's something that I wanted to bring up. Is this? There's a feeling of loneliness, melancholy here, and yeah. it's exactly that feeling, denied communication of the first two lines, that makes the autumn rain so fitting. And so, although it's it's the refrigerator poem, it feels random, and that's the source of its humor. But here. The leap is not random, and there's a connection between the two. And for me, it's the season, a melancholy season, a more lonely season. And even the rain, I think, is important because you hear the sound of the phone, of the phone and it stops. And maybe only then are you conscious of the sound of the rain, too. So I think, I think that's a valuable part, a part of the poem. Um, I have a question. Yes, please. Did the, did the phone only ring once before it was picked up or did it only ring once when it was never picked up? So that's part of the mystery of the poem, I think. Uh, and that's that's part of the engage way it engages us. We don't know the reason why it rang only once. Um, yeah. um, did somebody chicken out and change their mind? Is it a, you know, a, a former lover or a current lover or you know, a bill collector? Who knows why or who, what it was, uh, who's calling? Um, no caller ID, well, et cetera. It's part of the mystery. Having, having just driven through an hour of autumn rain, the one thing I thought about it was that I'm driving through this, you know, pine barrens in New Jersey, and it's beautiful colors, but the rain is muting them. And the fact that the rain is coming for the next few days is going to mean that's kind of the end of the fall color. So I, I agree that it's a sad. Uh, reference, um, and um, I think the poem could be interpreted as uh, it only rang once because I'm sitting here with nothing to do but feel sad about the autumn rain, and the phone rings. Oh boy, I picked it up. <laughs> or <laughs> maybe, maybe you know. Anyway, sorry. Go ahead. So that's an important thing. Um, the Japanese poet Seisen Sui referred to haiku as an unfinished poem. Not in the sense that it was inadequate or incomplete, but that the reader finishes it and that there's just enough information for you to get a feeling from it or get an image, et cetera. And it's vital that the reader finish the poem just as you did. And obviously today's experience for you, Henry, would be different than if you know, you're, you'd know you just been out skiing or whatever. Um, um, <laughs> the, so, the, what you bring to the poem is an important part of it. Uh, the reader finishes the poem, and that's why it's sometimes called an unfinished poem. Um, let's move on to an, another poem here. 
somebody else would like to read this. Uh, old retriever. He opens one eye at the yeah. tossed stick. So let me ask. Let me ask a question. Uh, how does this make any of you feel, especially those who haven't woken up yet? How do you feel when you read this? This is Judy. I'll talk. Um, yep. I feel good. I like it uh, because I love retrievers, and I know what it's like when they're aging, and so it has kind of a I don't know, a little bit of a, oh, you know, a warm, appreciative feeling. I like it. Okay, anyone else? I think um, it has like a like an, a sleepy, sweet feeling. And it kind of makes me think of this dog, this old dog, like lying in the sun, happy to be outside, but just not getting up doing anything because it's so relaxed. And it's just like a warm, fuzzy kind of nice feeling. It's content, I think. Um, what One thing that I particularly like about the poem is um, this is an old retriever and he's been there and done that. He chased lots of sticks. He doesn't need to do it anymore, but he still notices. Yeah, His oh, retrieverness nice. is still there. He opens one eye. He still is aware of the toss stick and makes a choice not to chase after it. But he cannot help but still notice it, and that's that's the detail I love about the poem. Um, it also, mm. you know, as we all get older, we can all relate to this more and more. I think um, of of uh, not having to prove ourselves over and over again, like mm. maybe a young puppy has. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, nice. I, I like that. the poem. Uh, I like the poem because it shows a concrete image without telling the reader how to interpret it. Exactly. Uh, and that's part of the unfinishedness I mentioned. Um, um, yeah, it's just the facts that are presented, a, an ob objective sensory image. Um, and we can feel what we want in reaction to it. And in this case, the refrigerator effect is, is reversed. The refrigerator line comes first. That's that's okay with the haiku. Um, uh, let's, I see. Yeah. So, so let's um, move on. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. I just thought that uh, the relationship here is the most obvious thing about this poem. That uh, the person who tosses the stick has been with this dog for quite some time, and the dog is continuing to play toss the stick, but just with one eye. Um, so you, you see an old owner as well as a, the old dog, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I do. I mean, somebody had to toss the stick. Yep, yep. And <laughs> all right. I didn't, see. I didn't, I didn't see an old owner necessarily, but I had a slightly different reading, which was more of a personification of the dog. It just came into my mind. Are you kidding me? Like the one eye effect. So yeah. I had a humorous kind of response to begin with. I like the other readings too, but I that's where I went. Yeah. Nice. I like that. I, I I love how we can bring our own takes on all the poems. Let me move on to the next poem. Somebody wants to read this. A bitter morning. Sparrows sitting together without any necks. James Hackett. A bitter morning. Sparrows sitting together without any necks. So um, some asides about this poem and the poet is um, he died a few years ago, but um, he used to live in the town of Haiku on Maui, <laughs> where W.S. Merwin also lived. Um, in Hawaiian language, it's it's not the same meaning as haiku as a poem, but uh, that's the town where, where he lived. And he also used to live just near me in California before he moved to Hawaii. And I visited him several times. This poem also won grand prize in the 1964 Japan Airlines International Haiku Contest. And it won the author a trip to Japan, which wow. is a 
pretty good pay rate per word, I'd say. Um, and it won out of 41,000 entries. So, uh, and, it, and I would also say it's probably the most famous haiku in English in Japan. Um, so with that aside, how does this poem make you feel? What do you see? How do you feel when you, when you read it? Cold. I feel like, <laughs> like I feel like a, a very, like a very brisk winter morning with uh, a very bare tree and these sparrows huddling together for warmth and tucking their heads in for warmth. And I feel like I'm looking out the window at this and like pulling a sweater around me because it's just cold. Yep. Yeah. Any other thoughts about it? Burr, it makes me feel cold. <laughs> this yeah. is Mary. Go ahead, Mary. I, it made me smile because I see sparrows quite a bit. And you're right, they don't have necks a lot of the time when they're sitting. <laughs> but it was, it so was a different perspective. Go ahead. You can see them all hunched up like this. Yes. Uh, um, and another detail is not just the hunching, um, but it's plural sparrows. They're, they're doing this together. So even the togetherness is an attempt to be warm, <clears throat> which to me makes it a communal sort of poem, not just, um, just it's not just one sparrow doing this. Um, and it makes the morning feel even more bitterly cold. And there's also empathy here too, an unspoken empathy, or at least that's what I read into the poem. <clears throat> that surely the poet uh, feels, you know, is worried about these sparrows. Will they survive the cold? Um, maybe there's confidence that they will, but there is at least some, for me, an empathy uh, for the sparrows. And I think that's uh, um, part of what goes on in a lot of haiku is, is empathy. And in fact, I would say empathy is one of the most important characteristics for writing haiku and for reading it. Um, when you encounter a poem that you might not have experienced, you can still empathize with it um, sometimes, depending on the emotion. Um, and that I found with reading and writing haiku over many years, that it's made me more empathetic. And, and to, to be, try to, I try to put myself in the shoes of the author and don't always expect the poem to come to me. I expect that sometimes I have to go to the poem. <coughs> Any other thoughts on, on this poem? Uh, just with me that that um, it's not exactly empathy, but but humans do the same thing. I mean, I know the older I get, the more the cold affects me. I love winter time. I love walking in the snow. I'm fortunate to live in the country. But uh, I definitely catch myself on cold mornings with my head sucked down into my shoulders. <laughs> Is it, so yeah. it's not sparrows that do that, you know, and that's one of the things I like about this poem, too. Yeah, I agree. Without, um, without negating any of the things that have been said, there's kind of an edge because it starts off with this word very close to the beginning of bitter. And I, I, I didn't as I was reading it, I didn't get to cold immediately. I got to the no. word bitter, which goes in a, a bunch of different directions. Then when I got to sparrows sitting together, then it started to be clearer as an image. So I just think it's a really interesting choice of the word. He could have done something else like bitter cold morning, which is redundant, but I'm just saying that the word bitter kind of caught me. It is an opening word, I think. It's, um, it's just slightly fuzzy at first. It's like bitter coffee. What does it mean? Um, but no, as you get to the rest of the poem, you, you, want, you know cold is the intent. Um, but, but that openness uh, in, allows of several ways into the poem to start with. Um, and I like how it then, then becomes more resolved as the poem uh, completes. Um, so yeah, I think that's, I, that's a completely good reading of the first line for sure. Um, one other aside about this poem, it was, although it won the 1964 contest, it was actually previously published in 1963 in the very first English language haiku magazine called American Haiku, published in Wisconsin. And there it was published in a shorter form. I think it was Bitter Morning, 
sparrows sitting without necks or something like that. So it was in a different form originally. So let's try another poem. Somebody please read this. This is Judy, I'll read it. Okay. Broken bowl, the pieces still rocking. So how do you Broken. feel when you when you read this, yeah. Judy? How do you feel? Um, like a little bit puzzled, but it feels um, like timely, like something just broke. Okay. Yeah. So it's got a moment happening in it. It's a very sharp moment. Okay, what puzzles you about the poem? Oh, maybe because it's so short. Um, some of the others gave us a little more of the image. I mean, Broken Bowl is a bit of an image, but it's also a bit of a concept. We, we don't see the pieces um, in the same kind of way. And the rocking, the word rocking, um, seems a little different than I think of it when something breaks, I think of shattered. So um, yeah, it's something I'd wanna sit with because it isn't okay. real clear to me anyway. So um, did anybody else wanna react to that uh, or how this poem strikes you the same or differently? Anyone else? Uh, I, you know, I, I will say something about this because I know Penny, but um, there could be some double on time here with this broken bowl. And I mean, it's sort of kind of like uh, you really get old. Like take us, for example, remember rock and roll? Well, we still rock sometimes. So in that sense, um, the pieces of the broken bowl still trying to get your attention is happening, um, even though it's past its prime suddenly. Uh, and that to me is, is beauty of the poem is that whatever kind of bowl this is, a cereal bowl, an antique bowl, you know, an heirloom, who knows, um, whether it's cheap or expensive, who knows, but it's maybe considered valuable or important to the poet and, or they wouldn't notice it, I don't think, or care, but they do notice that these broken pieces are still rocking and they're, they're going, it, it, it just broke here are these rocking pieces, and you know they're going to stop rocking in just a second or two. But for that one last moment, they're giving a kind of beauty, their last ounce of beauty to the observer. Or at least that's the way I like to see it. That, and the poet, poet notices this last breath of life, if you want to call it that, before it's swept away and thrown, thrown in the trash. Um, um, it's a very slight poem, very short poem. So there, it doesn't give you a whole lot else to hang on to. That to me is where I go, go with it. Um, and you could also ask, what is the refrigerator effect here? Well, dramatically we have broken bowl as one independent part. And then the piece is still rocking as a separate grammatical phrase. So you do have the two parts grammatically. Um, the pieces of course refers again to the broken bowl. Um, and not all poems will do that. They'll shift more dramatically with the two parts. Um, but you do have a little bit of that refrigerator effect in this poem. Any last comments or feelings about it before we move on? I, I remained uneasy. So I don't know. I don't know much more to say about it. Maybe it's the rocking. I just wasn't. I just felt a little off kilter because of that. So the poem is making you feel uneasy or the meaning of the poem is uneasy for you or, or what? Can we dig into that a bit? Yeah, maybe it's maybe it's just the image of the rock, the continuing, you know, the, the bowl is broken, but the pieces continue to, to do something just kind of put me a little bit on edge. Okay. Um, 
you don't like it? Is that what you mean? No, no, or... no, not at all, not at all, not at all. Uneasy, uneasy, like like there's an earthquake or I don't know, just <laughs> uh, there's okay. an uneasiness to the poem. No, no I like yeah. the poem a lot, actually. So it, it has some tension, might be a right. way to dis right. describe yeah. it. Okay, yeah. got it. Yeah. Um, okay, the and bowl, I think that, go ahead. The bowl was, <laughs> the bowl was born to rot. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, my first reading was that the bowl was broken in the midst of an argument. And then I thought, okay, it could just be a, a woman or a man sitting alone in their kitchen and drop the bowl. But that tension that you spoke to, I felt that really clearly the first time I read the poem too. I was like, okay, something happened here. Yep, and yep. Those pieces still rock. And it's, it's a very open poem in that in that regard. So that's actually was a question I would ask next is why did it break? You know, we can add all sorts of answers. Right. Uh, an accident dropping it, a, you know, a dog's tail wagging it off the counter or something. Um, any any number of reasons. Um, and that's right. part of the openness of the poem. That it gives. Right. You can put a lot of stuff in a bowl and it could be a relationship um, I think it's really my appreciation's growing by the second. <laughs> yeah. That is so what I love about haiku when you put one out there in the world and you get people's comments back. I'm always amazed that some people's interpretation of what I've written is better than what I thought of at first. And I read it, and I say, that's what I meant. I mean, <laughs> and they're wildly different, they come from different places, just like we just did on this one. We came from all over the place, and there's empty space. Yeah for each of us to come in. So yes, thank you. Let's move on to another poem here. Somebody could read this. Okay. Distant thunder, the dog's toenails click against the linoleum, Gary Hotham. Distant um, thunder, the dog's toenails click against the linoleum. When I when I teach this in schools, some some kid always raises a hand and says, "What's linoleum?" <laughs> <laughs> um, and if you don't know, I mean, it, it's a it's a fair question. Um, this hard, it's sort of plasticky flooring. Um, so, how does this make any of you feel? Nervous. Okay. Nervous for you or for the dog? <laughs> Both. When, when I've been in a house with a pacing dog, there's nothing that conveys urgency more. That dog either needs a, a hug or a walk or a something. But when they get anxious, I they telegraph their anxiety in all directions. So And the thunder adds to that, and I just feel it instead of thinking it. Yeah. Other feelings from anyone? Well, to me, uh, I'm not sure if it's a feeling or not, but I feel like I'm somewhere stuck between the thunder and the toenails in this poem. It's like uh, the macrocosm, microcosm kind of uh, setup. Yeah, I think there's a big and small, uh, and that's somewhat sometimes part of the contrast that goes on between the two parts. Exactly. Um, a detail that I especially like in this poem is this is distant thunder and it could be the dog hears it better than we do mm. and uh, to me that the dog is nervous about the thunder we all know dogs hate thunder and fireworks and so on but in this case they're already anxious about even distant thunder um, which I for me helps me feel more empathetic toward the dog and its stress over this and even a distant thunder causes this anxiety. Um, and of course, there's a sound going on in the poem, not just the thunder, but the clicking of the toenails. Um, and I love the sound of the word linoleum too. And you can really imagine that those clicking toenails um, on, on that flooring there. Um, um, yeah, so the, lots going on in this poem. Um, and it's, it's another dog poem. I think we've had one or two already. Any other quick thoughts before we move on? Okay, 
Here's another one. I'll read this one. Passport check. My shadow waits across the border by George Swede. How do you feel on hearing this? Nervous. Okay. That Me too, of nervous. Yeah, that feeling of nervousness, like, uh-oh, what's gonna happen? That kind of stress what, that we go through at borders or through security. Um, yeah, that nervous, stressed the feeling. The uncertainty. And yet and the, the, shadow, the shadow indicates the desire as well. You wanna I'm get through this. I felt all anticipatory. Oh, crossing that yep. border and my shadow's there already and I'm not yet. Yep. Um, I, for some reason, I've always pictured this being outdoors somehow, and the, the person is walking across the border. Um, it might be the shadow from a, you know, a overhead light of some kind, but for some reason, I picture crossing a border to Tijuana from San Diego or, you know, some mm. European place where you're walking across the border. That's just me. That's what I bring to it. But it could, you could be in an airport, and it's just this border is imaginary line of being on the other side of the passport check um whatever it is there's this anxiety and desire that's that's uh competing with each other they're, they're competing these two parts any other thoughts oh, quickly go ahead the shadow, the shadow does make it without the passport yes <laughs> <laughs> shadow is there okay Moving on here. Somebody please read this. I'll go. Summer afternoon, the coolness of the newspaper from the grocery bag. Summer afternoon, the coolness of the newspaper from the grocery bag. Cor Vanden Heuvel. Thank you. So anyone, why do you think the newspaper is cool? The grocery store was air conditioned. Okay. Any other reasons? That it's wrapped in plastic. Okay. Could be. Maybe there were cold groceries. Maybe there was ice cream and things that made it cold in the bag. That's where I go. That the newspaper, which normally isn't cool or you don't normally think of it as having a temperature, must have been next to something cold. Yeah, and I like to think ice cream. And what this <laughs> poem, what this poem is really about, I think, is the heat of the summer afternoon. We, we go by that first line pretty quickly, it's sort of generic almost. But this poem is really about heat, I think, because we're surprised by the coolness of the newspaper and something in the in the um, grocery bag that made it made the newspaper cool and and so this is an awareness of temperature here um and a sense of touch as well um does this poem have as strong a feeling for you as the, uh, some of the other poems or not it does for me but um because i like core maybe i don't know <laughs> um I can sort of hear him say this poem. I don't know. So you're at an advantage there. Carla, you were shaking your head. It, I get, I mean, it brings to mind uh, some feelings, but it's sort of like a very, to me, like a, a very lazy, laid back, hot summer afternoon, just ran to the grocery store for a bag of groceries. Nobody else is around and you're unpacking it and that's what you notice. And then maybe you're going to sit down and read the newspaper afterwards. But it's just, it seems like to my mind, it's just very, very kind of a relaxed, lazy, late summer, hot afternoon. Perhaps a more subtle feeling. Very. Yeah. What I really like about this, I think, is that haiku is often about the tiniest observation that normally would slip by in your busy life, but when you really see it, you really see it. Yeah. yeah. For me, a haiku helps you notice what you forget to notice. Um, exactly that. 
you, you notice the, un, the, the uncommon and the common. Um, yeah, it just makes you pay attention. And it means being present. Yeah, it means being present and not preoccupied. It means being yeah. all the way there. Yeah, it's also the kind of thing that, like you were saying, just slips right by, you know, most people and most of us during the day. But those little moments um, where you just notice something like that. Yeah. If everything matters, if anything matters. It, yeah. It's good. So you, um, you know this, but you forgot you knew. And the poem yeah. reminds you. Mm hmm yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's uh, probably need to pick up the pace here. Um, I'll read this one. Spring breeze, the pull of her hand as we near the pet store. Now, I'll ask you a question, especially of those of you who have never seen this poem before. How old is the her in this poem? Give me a picture. Her six year old. Say it again. But I picture a six-year-old, and it's okay. probably just because I have one. <laughs> okay. That's what about the rest of you? Father and daughter. Okay. Uh, and, uh, you know, she wants a pet. Dad knows who's going to be taking care of it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't <So> know. <laughs> I have generally found, and maybe, maybe this is true for a lot of you, generally found that people tend to picture a child female yeah. as well. and and yet it doesn't actually say so where is that feeling of this being a child where is that coming from in the poem spring okay Any, I anything else remembering, i think it's from remembering both as a child and as a mom that tug when you when the child wants something and the mom's just ambling along well you're saying that okay. but I, right. I have this visceral memory of the pull of the hand around animals in general, whether I was pulling or my kids were pulling or my grandkids now. Okay. And I also yeah. think even the word pet suggests some, kids like pets. And we associate children with kittens and puppies kinds of thing. So I think all of those things tend to work together to give you this idea of a child. Um, all, since I wrote the poem, I can tell you that it was actually written in the summer and it was a coffee shop with my adult girlfriend. The core, <laughs> the core of the experience for me was the pull of her hand. And when I felt that, when normally I was the one who was always walking faster, but when I felt the pull of her hand, that was arresting to me. And it was joyful, it was enthusiastic, it just felt spring like and more like pets than. Pet store, and it was just very intuitive to me to change um, everything but the core feeling of the poem to these other details that that sort of pointed to youthful enthusiasm or, or that kind of thing. So I changed some of the details in order to be true to the experience. And not everyone likes that. They think the poem has to be completely 100% what happened. Um, and that's your choice. But for me, I'm writing poems, not diary entries. So I feel I can take poetic license with it to convey the poetic truth that might differ from what actually happened. So that's why I include this poem as an example. Um, any last thoughts? Okay, one more here. I think I think it's just one more. Oh, maybe a couple more. Someone want to read this? Home for Christmas. My childhood desk drawer empty. Ouch. Sorry, what was that, Robin? Ouch. Why? <laughs> because coming home for Christmas and finding that, well, I associated a lot of my friends came home and found their rooms have been repurposed into guest rooms with all traces yep. of themselves vanished. <laughs> and that's an ouch. Yeah, it's a bit of an ouch. It's sort of a recognition of growing up. <laughs> um, <laughs> And yet nostalgia too. Um, I can still see the drawer and the moment that this I was inspired to write this. And I remember there were crayon marks on the sides <laughs> of the inside drawer. 
Uh, oh, man. It, it brought to mind my experience of coming home from prep school and my mother sold my Lionel trains. Uh, <laughs> my mother gave away my Hot Wheels. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> uh, <sighs> okay, let's move so on. Could I ask a question, Michael? Oh, yes, please. So um, on several of these, it makes me think a little bit about metaphor because often my mind wants to go symbolically with these and kind of pull away from the literalness, but it sort of feels like the way we're talking about them that we should stay pretty literal, but you know, the childhood desk drawer empty, that emptiness could mean a lot of things about uh, childhood or returning home for Christmas and kind of like the broken bowl still rocking. It could be, so what did this break mean that it is still rocking in the person? No. Is that kind of wrong to, to no. you know, read into them or would you speak to that? Yeah, so I think it's excellent that you read into the poems that way. I think that is part of the reverberation of what makes a haiku work is that they can have this metaphorical level. Um, um, I'm suddenly thinking of a poem by Kay Anderson, something like uh, five years in the wrong window, the iris blooms, something like that. And um, I shared that poem with a friend of mine who immediately loved it because she had been married for five years, felt utterly stifled in her marriage. She just got divorced. She moved to California, that's where I knew her. And she suddenly felt like she was blooming. Wow. And so for her, it was utterly a metaphor. Five years in the wrong window, the iris finally blooms or whatever it was. And uh, those kinds of applications of a poem to our lives or to things we know that are in other people's lives, are absolutely part of the reverberations of poems. And you, you wanna be careful not to try too hard to write that into it. But if you trust the image on the objective level, it will gain those metaphorical extra levels on its own sometimes. And if it doesn't, that still can be okay. But when it does, why not? You know, that's fine. I would just notice, I would just note though, that the overt metaphor within the poem tends to explain the poet's intent and meaning. Like, this is what I think of what you, what I've just described. So I'm gonna throw a metaphor in this, tell you some kind of meaning. And it tends to push the reader away. So it's better if the metaphor happens outside the poem, just as you were saying, Judy, that you add this to it. That kind of metaphor is absolutely great in a haiku um, uh, when it, it, it occurs extrinsically to the poem rather than overt metaphor used within the poem. And same with simile. Um, they can be used in haiku, and there isn't really a rule against them, but it, you have to be pretty careful with it. Great, thank you. Thank you. All right, one more here. Whoops. Uh, hold on here. Yeah. I did have this one here. <laughs> I'll read this one. Grocery shopping, pushing my cart faster through feminine protection. So this is a guy poem, perhaps. I don't know. Um, this is an example of, of what I would call, I would say this is an example of what's called a senyu, S-E-N-R-Y-U, uh, which is like haiku, but tends to have a victim or make fun of something or someone, often oneself tends to be more about human nature. Um, uh, there are other differences between haiku and, and senyu, and it's, there's a lot of, you know, uh, willingness and disagreement about it. Um, and to some degree, the distinction doesn't matter a whole lot, but if you think of it as a continuum where it's kind of uncertain in the middle, what, whether it's a haiku or a senyu, that's really all you need to know. Um, haiku tend to, tend to be more serious, but not always. Send you tend to be more humorous, but not always. There are sometimes very satirical, biting, and dark send you that are not funny at all, um, but they tend to victimize something or make fun of a foible or something like that. Um, so it's, I just mentioned this as in passing, as it's a, a variety of haiku that you can write. 
All right, now we'll get to this. Um, we've sort of already been talking in detail about a lot of these poems. Um, but just quickly, if anyone wants to speak up, which poem did you like the best or which was puzzling to you? Okay, and maybe I, we've already, go ahead. I think for me, um, just on a personal note, I enjoyed the, uh, the pet ones because it, it triggered a, a fond memory in me. So about the dog's toenails and the old dog lifting his eyelid. So those, you know, kind of touched me in a certain way. But I think the ones that intrigued me more were the ones that I read metaphor into, like the bowl still, uh, the pieces still rocking um, or the shadow across the border, what's going on in there. Um, so I had two levels of reaction. So it was enjoyable. So uh, thank you. Okay. And um, I think it's worth cultivating one's sensitivity to haiku in that way, the different ways you can respond to a haiku. So thank you. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. uh, for me, the one that puzzled me the most was uh, the one about the broken bowl and the pieces still rocking because I thought uh, that the bowl might have been thrown by somebody out of anger and that uh, the poem is still uh, in the, very much in the moment of that, but it doesn't say that, that um, say so in the poem itself. Uh, so I'm guessing that there is, uh, like you said, tension and even anger in the poem. So for me, it sounds like you completely do get it um, mm -hmm. because all of that is true for the poem, I think, mm -hmm. but it's a much sl slimmer poem. So it takes a bigger risk in hoping you'll get to conclusions like that. Um, yeah. And some, some poems don't take quite the same risks. Um, right. So I'm suddenly thinking of another poem that I'll mention here. Um, one of mine, an old woolen sweater taken yarn by yarn from the snowbank. An old woolen sweater taken yarn by yarn from the snowbank. What season is that? Mm. Anyone? Spring, winter. Okay, why spring? Why spring? I feel like it's uh, the snowback is melting, and there it is in there, left from the winter time. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. What else? Other thoughts? Uh, I don't know why I think it's fine. Why? Why is the old woolen sweater being taken yarn by yarn? Oh, I thought it was winter. Here. Okay, winter. And that's but, why it's being taken yarn by yarn. But why would the winter do that? Why would that happen in winter and not spring? Well, I'm not positive, but I guess I just saw it as, as kind of half in there and you're kind of trying to pull it out and it's just yeah. maybe unraveling or partly coming out. And so it could be spring, but I just... Okay. I saw winter when I heard it. So. Okay, and that's fine. So I mean, I'm mentioning this poem because it takes a risk. Um, it is a spring poem, but no one mentioned, no one yet mentioned why it's a spring poem. Hmm. Why are the why is the sweater being taken yarn by yarn? The sweater is unraveling. Um, I, I thought being, winter. I, I know you're saying it's a spring poem, but what I thought was that maybe it was um, children uh, playing. Somebody grabbed a yarn, and the other child was running away or, or on the snowbank or something like that. It's unraveling somehow. Rick? Yeah, birds are doing it. <gasps> no. Okay. It took me a while to get there, but that's my reading yeah. of it. Because I got lost in the yarn by yarn in the sense of the word yarn is like a story. So okay. someone tells a yarn 
<laughs> and I kind of went down that road for a while, which is I'm sure that not where you wanted me to go. And then when I finally thought, okay, why is it yarn by yarn? I picture birds doing it to make their nests. So that's exactly my point. And I noticed when Rick, when you said that, at least one other person went, ah, I don't know who did, said did that, but that's the refrigerator effect. And I get there, if I get there, by taking a risk, by deliberately leaving something out of the palm uh, so that you can figure it out. And once you get there, I'm hoping, and you might not get there, and then that's you know maybe my fault, but um, when you get there, there is this, ah, sort of moment of, ah, that's what's being talked about here. That's what's left out of the palm. And I, as I say sometimes, in a haiku, sometimes you have to take out the most important thing mm. so that it can be implied. And in this case, I took out the bird and nest. And I was gratified when William Higginson produced his haiku world collection of, of season words and example poems. He used this poem under the heading of nest as a spring season, season word, even though the word is not actually even mentioned at all. Um, but it's meant to be implied uh, that this is what's happening. So that's why it's a spring poem, but it's completely natural and fine to think of, to wonder if it's winter because I mentioned snow. Um, and so I'm totally taking a risk with the poem and it may not work for some people, but I like to think that when it does and it does click that that's part of the, the joy of the poem. Um, yeah. and, and learning how to withhold something in the poem is part of the art of haiku. Um, that gets, so a, little, now the, that gets a little bit freaky for me. We we prejudge many poems going off. We get 3,000 poems going to Haiku Society of America every year, and they want 300 to judge. And I hate to think that I miss some that are that extraordinary because I don't see the leap. You know, you read and you do your best and you spend as much time as you can as you winnow the field. But we really stopped and thought about that for a while. And then there it was, aha. I'm certain um, I've missed some. I'm certain of it but, uh, by reading them too quickly. So I completely understand. Yeah, the yeah. aha is really deep under. I, uh, my connection has been uh, broken a little, but I wanted to answer the question before the last question, which was the poem that did that for me was the Broken Bowl poem. Um, I find it happens frequently when I go back to read something um maybe the second or third time i see a whole different context as it were yeah well thank you for those comments um let's pivot a bit here um and i want us to brainstorm some common characteristics of the poems we've just heard so um any um Pardon me while I uh, trying to trying to see the chat. Uh, I haven't seen it. Um, I'm just catching up with chat now. Um, that, hmm. Okay. Um, so what I'd like to do, and I don't know if we can do it in the chat or. I'll try to do it in the chat. Um, is um, what I wanted to do is think of some common characteristics of the poems that we've we've gone over. Um, try not to think necessarily of what you may have learned about haiku before, but what are some common characteristics of these poems? For me, it's the strong sensory um images so it could be the single ring of the phone that you kind of hear or the pull of the hand or the image of the threads so there's a very strong kind of concrete sensory image in there okay so i've, I've typed sensory imagery images in the chat and i'm going to add the word concrete that's important what else other characteristics Contrasts, okay. I would say that relates to the uh, the two part structure that we talked about before, um, which relates to the refrigerator effect idea uh, to give a poem two parts. So reaction to environment, 
Um, uh, so for, there's two parts of that I think are worth unpacking. One is that you are, as the poet, you are part of some environment and you pay attention to it and you report it, but you have a reaction to it as well. I think that, that both of those things are valuable. Um, one thing that's been a discovery for ha in haiku for me is that it's made me more aware of things, to notice things more. But it's also helped me notice my feelings, reaction to those things. So it's totally uh, a reaction to environment that, that goes on in haiku. Yes, I really like that. Uh, so Jackie, you wrote uh, juxtaposition and that, mm -hmm. that goes with the two part structure um, that one part is juxtaposed with another and I'll speak to that for a second and say that there are two aspects of this for me in haiku. One is grammatically, you have one thing and then another, and they're grammatically independent, but they're also imagistically different. In other words, if I say uh, the horse is galloping through the snow, it's hooves blurred. In a way that's two parts grammatically. But imagistically, it's the same thing because they're both about the horse. If I say the horse is galloping through snow, divorce pending, that's a leap. That's a leap away. That's more, that's closer to the refrigerator effect. And uh, it may be too much of a leap, but you see the difference there? You want a grammatical separation and an imagistic leap between the two parts. Mm -hmm. And I'll mention here for those of you who are to this in Japanese uh, the, the technique is uh, uses a what's called a kireji uh, or I'll type that in um, so you see the word kire means cut and G means word so cutting word and it in spoken Japanese uh, there is a or written uh, there is a word in haiku that cuts the poem into two parts and that's where this two-part structure and idea of juxtaposition comes from um, uh, and it's part of the um, structure of a haiku that's seldom taught in schools. Uh, Amy's typed in engaging, and I totally agree with that. Uh, I think the sensory images engage us and make us feel a moment. Um, that's one of the goals of haiku is to make us feel something, which was why I was always asking you, how does this poem make you feel? Any other characteristics? Hmm. There's a Latin phrase, multum in parvo, much in little. Mm. And yes. it, haiku is always so much in so little, more implied than present, but enough things really present that you're enjoying to, pull, to create some more. Okay, and I, there's a compression that goes on in a haiku. Um, and one of the sources of that compression is this two-part structure, is that it creates a tension or relationship of one thing with another and begs the question, what does this have to do with that? And in a momentary mystery, and that mystery engages you. And, and if, it, if it didn't have that two-part structure, it has to engage you in some other way, or maybe it won't. Um, there's another thing that, that's common with haiku that is also part of its compression. Uh, no one's mentioned it yet. It's one of the most important things about haiku. Seasonality. There you go. So uh, <laughs> yeah, there's a Japanese word kigo, uh, which means season word. And so when I say spring breeze, the pull of her hand, it's near the pet store. Spring is directly naming the season or the summer afternoon, uh, et cetera, uh, the fullness of the newspaper. So the, sun, the season is directly named there. Or in some cases, it might be more subtle, like um, uh, distant thunder. To me, I would associate that with Midwest thunderstorms. So I think of the summer, uh, for me anyway. Um, mm -hmm. And some of, the, so, some of the other things that I've mentioned have a seasonality to it. And this is one of the most important things in haiku to, to invoke the, the paradigms of the seasons. 
uh, and maybe relating to that to the seasons of life, et cetera. There was a comment? Someone, someone was saying something? So some other characteristics are, obviously these are poems. Um, pretty basic to say that, but yeah, let's not forget that these are poems. And the ones I've been sharing are all in three lines, but in Japan, haiku is actually a single line written vertically. Um, and some people suggest that a single horizontal line in English is the equivalent. And a lot of people do write haiku as one-liners in, in English. <clears throat> but it can still have the two parts within that one line, uh, or it can still have these other targets such as uh, shooting for images and objective sensory things. So that's actually another thing I should add here is um, five senses. That's a key part of, of haiku is to, to present something um, through your five senses. And I'll add this to uh, you're going to you're going to try and create an emotion. That's the that's the idea of sharing it. So you want you're saying this is an emotion I had in reaction to something. And maybe you'll have the same feeling too. And if you were going to write down one thing from this entire workshop today, especially if you're new to haiku, uh, it would be this. Don't write about your feelings, which may seem contradictory given everything I've said. Instead though, write about what caused your feelings. And that helps you get to the objective sensory image and if you present that, present the image, the experience, then the feeling will go along with it uh, automatically. And just to demonstrate this effect, just within a single word, think of the word chair. You can picture lots of chairs, but if I say easy chair, you have feelings that go with that. Or if I say electric chair, you have very different feelings that go with that. And haiku trusts those feelings, trusts the image to convey feeling. And um, uh, I think it was T.S. Eliot who talked about what he called the objective correlative, that objects correlate to emotions. And the haiku just lives and breathes that, that the objects that you present as objective sensory images correlate to emotion. And it's the emotion you're trying to convey. Um, maybe that's too much theory. You're, kind of, you're sharing your experiences and you're hoping other people will share the feeling. That's really the bottom line for it. Any comments or questions or other thoughts? Other common characteristics or anything we haven't talked about? Do you think there's a season word in the pottery poem? No. Or a, I didn't think so, but I just wanted to know if I missed something. Nope. No, and in fact, I thank you for pointing that out because it's an indoor poem and not all poems are going to be seasonal or perhaps they'll be seasonal on a metaphorical level. Like obviously if something's broken and maybe it's autumnal or dying in winter or something like that, you might associate it uh, with end of life, end of, end of the year kind of thing, but there's no actual season in the poem. And so this actually, is where the metaphor of haiku targets is important, is that we have many targets we can aim at, and I've just been typing them into the chat. Um, this, the season word, the, the two-part structure, the five senses, all these other things, Ob objectivity, for example. Sometimes you're gonna hit those with a particular poem, and a particular poem may not hit them, hit every target. So the broken bowl poem does not hit the season word target. Um, uh, there's a poem by Jack Kane. Um, it's been controversial for decades. An empty elevator opens, closes. Mm -hmm. Again. An empty elevator opens, closes. That's all there is to the poem. Um, and it's mysterious. Why did it open? Who put, pressed the button? Where did they go? So there, it engages you in that way. There's no season word. It's an indoor poem. And you can be non-seasonal with indoor poems but also non-seasonal with some outdoor poems on occasion because you're choosing, hopefully choosing, to not hit the season word target, but instead you're hitting other targets. And for me, a poem becomes a haiku if it hits a 
if it predom if it hits a predominance of targets, a preponderance of targets is a better way to put it. Um, there are many possible targets. And if you hit enough of them, yeah, it's a haiku. If it's a 10 line poem, you've missed the, the three line, one line kind of general target. But even that is not necessarily the only way. It could be a two liner or four liner where you might scatter the words down the page or print them one per line and it's a vertical line or something else. Um, and it could still be a haiku. So there's many ways, it's sort of organic, many ways to, for something to be a haiku. Um, but there's one thing we have not talked about, but we're really close to it at the moment. It came up when we were talking about the refrigerator poem and I said I would, we would talk about it later. Five, seven, five. There you go. Okay. So most of the poems that have gone by are not five, seven, five. Um, why? Um, because wasn't that what we were all taught haiku was supposed to be uh, in grade school? We were all taught five, seven, five. And if you look on the internet, Instagram, all the, the haiku shared there seem to be five, seven, five. Um, if you look at Cor Van and Hull's haiku anthology, the great bulk of the poems are not 575. And why is that? Well, that's because one thing, uh, in Cor's anthology anyway, I think the poems are aiming at different targets, not simply counting syllables. Um, it's a choice to aim at 575. It's not necessarily the, the only target that matters. Um, but I would say it can be a dangerous target to matter, to, to aim at because um, of differences in language, 575, now here's, here's something that may be a surprise to some of you if you're new to haiku. Uh, 575 syllables in English is actually, as I see it, a violation of Japanese form for haiku, not a preservation of it. It is a violation of the Japanese form. Here's why. Um, the word haiku itself, it's two syllables in English, but it counts as three sounds in Japanese. The word Tokyo, that we might say is Tokyo, sounds like three syllables, um, is actually pronounced as Tokyo, which may sound like two, but it actually counts as four sounds. To-o, kyo-o is what they're counting. Um, the word sign, one syllable in English, Japanese, if they were to count that, it would be counted as saya. The end sound at the end of the word is is um, um, is it's counted as a separate syllable. So what they're counting is not like our syllables. And I was reading um, Kit Pankos Nagamura um, published a book of Olympic game haiku uh, earlier this year. It was meant to be for the Tokyo Olympics. Um, and in her introduction, she said something fascinating to me. She said, if you write 17 syllables in English, you are typically including enough information to fill two haiku in Japanese. That's how stark the difference <laughs> is. And uh, to me, that's amazing. And it, it's true that if you write 575, it's a choice and you can still hit other targets and still write a good 575 haiku. You are still producing a haiku, a poem that's significantly longer in content than the Japanese haiku. So if you think of haiku in Japan as being like a baseball, that size, density, if you write, and that's 575 sounds that they're counting, or on is the word. Um, if you think of Japanese haiku as being like a baseball, and then you write haiku 575 syllables in English, you're actually producing a softball, <laughs> if that, metaphor makes sense. And just translating the number without thinking the quality of the quality of what you're translating um, is, is misleading. So it's like saying, uh, if you think 575 syllables in English is the same as 575 sounds in Japanese, it's like saying 100 yen is equal one to $100. They're just not equal. And I'll, I'll move on from this subject in a moment, but I'll, I'll leave you with this. Maybe you have questions too. Um, uh, to illustrate the difference between the languages, think of the word Joe and just shorten it, not the name Joe with the E on the end, but Joe. That is what a Japanese syllable sounds like. But in English, 
we can may add more sounds, still keep it one syllable that immediately departs from Japanese. We can say jo or joy, joy, feel the mouth move, still one syllable. We can put an S on the end, joys. We can uh, make it uh, a female name, Joyce, um, with a slightly different uh, ending. We can put a T on the end of it, Joyce, still one syllable. But only that first initial jo is what happens in practically every syllable in Japanese. They stop counting at that single sound and we can do a whole lot more. And I, we can even go further in English. Joyce, you can pluralize it, still one syllable. And you can find other examples in other languages that do a similar progression that immediately depart from the single sound that's counted in Japanese. So you don't have to write 575 in, in English. You may choose to, and that I, I, I can respect that. And there's excellent haiku that have been written 575. And I'll share one of mine if, if you like, which is um, Tulip Festival. The colors of all the cars in the parking lot. <laughs> okay, it's 575. But to me, it's irrelevant. Well, I wasn't aiming at 575, and it doesn't have more virtue because it's 575. Instead, it has two parts. It has a seasonal reference. It has clear sensory imagery. Hopefully, it gives you a feeling. Um, the colors of the tulips made me aware of the colors of the car. That's the experience that I have. Um, um, it also has the three times, and Japanese doesn't have articles, so immediately it becomes easier to translate because three of those words um, are not, not even considered when writing uh, the Japanese translation, um, which helps it still fit, I think, in Japanese, but it's still a relatively long poem. Um, some years ago, um, University, University of Hawaii Press published Haiwa, which is a piece Japanese, it was an anthology of peace related haiku. They invited haiku from all over the world and they translated all these mostly 575 haiku into, into Japanese. And they said in the introduction, without batting an eye, that they had to take out one of the lines of most of the poems to make them fit in Japanese. Which I, to me is, that's a radical revision of a poem, but they had to do it to make it fit. You don't always have to do it make something fit. Um, um, but I've seen some translations of some of my haiku where, where not everything is included because in English it's too long, even if, it, even if it's 15 syllables. So this is my little soapbox about 575. Uh, but I will, I will say that if you choose to write 575, um, just make sure you're hitting the other targets. Um, Objectivity, five senses, uh, the season word perhaps, uh, or the cutting word, the two-part structure, the refrigerator effect. Make sure you hit all those targets and don't just count syllables uh, because it's not the syllable counting that makes it a haiku. And in fact, when I talked about hitting a preponderance of targets for something to be a haiku, 575 is not for me among those targets that make something a haiku. Um, but it is for some people. And for a lot of people, the way I was taught and miswrote haiku for 12 years, that was the only target. Um, I wasn't even given the luxury of being told it might be a nature poem. Um, uh, so there you go. Um, that's my lecture on 575. Any questions before we move on? <laughs> or I so uh, you in yeah. what word do you use for the Japanese? Um, I've heard different things like breath sounds um, and some Japanese words. You're cutting out. I'm not hearing you. Oh, the internet cut out. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not hearing the question. Sorry, the, the internet cut out. You might have to put it in the chat. So I, 
I think we may have to move on here. Uh, Henry, I'm sorry we're not, not hearing you, uh, but perhaps we can get back to your question. Um, there, um, you were talking about Japanese terms. You maybe. Uh, Oops. Okay, he's logged okay. off now. Um, so, something I will say something briefly, and maybe you won't hear this answer if it was part of his question. Um, uh, there are Japanese terms like kigo for season words and kireji for cutting word and and other other Japanese terms. Um, my feeling is that it's fine to use the English equivalent. It's okay to say season word um, because the other the Japanese terms can, they're useful at, in some places, but they can be jargon and uh, sort of clubby um, if we use them too much. Um, whereas the idea of Oh, include a seasonal reference in your haiku. That's pretty clear to, to anyone um, as, as an option, as a target you can choose to aim at. Um, uh, but yeah, I tend to, tend to not use Japanese terms too much unless I'm explaining the origin of the concept behind them. You're back, Henry? Uh, yeah, breath sound. That's what I was talking about as a way of describing a Japanese syllable. Breath, breath sound. stone? Breath sound. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, you could say that applies to syllable, though. I, I'm not sure it's all that helpful because what's counted in Japanese is so much shorter than the varieties of what can be considered one syllable. In yeah. um, or haiku a, a has been described. Poem. Sorry? A one breath poem. Exactly, yeah. Haiku has been described as a one breath poem, but some of us take deeper breaths than others. So <laughs> even that has a limitation, if you ask me. I, it, would, it would be fun to see how long, how many syllables <laughs> somebody could say within a single breath. I'll, be, I'll bet it's a hell of a lot more than 30 or 40. Um, uh, so the idea of a natural breath is, is it's a nice idea and I, it's, it's fine, but um, it's not terribly helpful on a scientific level. Um, any more questions on, on form before we move on here? We, we've gone for 90 minutes already. Um, are we okay? Everyone's I'm happy to keep going. Thrilled to have you continue. People seem to be happy staying with us. Okay. If anybody does need to leave, I understand, and I hope this has been beneficial for you. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to keep going. Uh, so let's let's keep doing that. Um, let me move to my next PowerPoint slide here. So this is a summary of what we've just been talking about. That haiku is a genre of brief poetry of which form is just one part. A lot of people refer to haiku as a form of poetry. Fine, it's not a big deal. But for me, I think genre is a better word because it then puts the form that it could possibly take as a subset of the larger picture. It uses objective sensory imagery, five senses, two parts juxtapositional structure, benefits from a season word. I choose the word benefits carefully. It doesn't, I wouldn't say it requires a season word, but it benefits from a season word often. Um, and it implies an emotion that is intuitive. So. That to me, or at least to me, are the key haiku targets, not necessarily the only ones. One that's not mentioned here is illusion. And illusion used to be far more common in Japanese poetry uh, than it might be today. But there, there will be allusions to things, um, especially other poems woven into haiku that the audience was expected to know and understand. And also the effect of place names. and. Uh, so if I say Matsushima, that may mean nothing to you. But in Japan, it's a reference to one of the most famous and most beautiful places uh, called, the, I think it's called the Place of a Thousand Islands, Pine Islands. Uh, uh, there, it's a very beautiful part of Japan and, and it's been written about a lot. So any reference to Matsushima uh, uh, brings to mind famous poems that have been written over centuries about that place. And an equivalent in English would be Niagara. 
Mm-hmm. You think of the, the power of the waterfall, the, the stories that have gone on there, the, the people trying to go over it with a barrel or you know, tightrope walkers trying to walk across it and just the power and beauty of the falls on their own. Uh, that's the kind of effect that some of the place names that are used in Japanese haiku will have. Um, and, and they're, they're straightforward. Uh, there, there's nothing unique or special about it. But if we say Rocky Mountains or uh, Eiffel Tower or Statue of Liberty or um, Sydney Harbor Bridge, I don't know, whatever it is, it'll, it'll carry a, a weight to it that engages us uh, in, in special ways. So these are things that, that are not mentioned here that, that we can do in English that are like uh, what they do in Japan. Um, so uh, those of you um, who have been around haiku a bit, or those of you who are new, is there anything you think you'd add to this list that I've not mentioned? Uh, the one thing I would add, Michael, is just the sound of the poem. That it has to sound right. My one yep. of my haiku mottos is if it doesn't sound right, it's not right. Yep. Um, it's like that. The haikus are easy. Refrigerator tacked on to the end of that. It's a joke, but it doesn't sound right. Um, yep. And a lot of you know my own poems that fail fail because I just can't quite get the sound to capture the experience to, it, it all has to fit together. And for me, the ones that work are the ones that sound like what, they, what, they're, what they're portraying, what, what's enclosed in the poem. So I, I think the sound yeah. of haiku is very important. Okay, and uh, I agree. Um, and I know you're a musician, so I can see why that's important to you. Um, and it's important to me too. Um, and some of the techniques that we use in poetry, like um, assonance and consonance or slant rhyme. Um, rhyme can be too overpowering in a haiku when it's so short, it sort of points to the words instead of the feeling or the emotion or the image. Um, but sometimes a careful rhyme and some of those other sound techniques that we use in longer poetry are exactly what make the haiku fall into place. Um, just because it sounds right and it has a unity to it. So yeah, that's, that's uh, um, I think it's fair to say that that's a slightly more advanced technique, but it's really important, I agree. Thank you. Yep. Anyone else? Okay, now that I've stunned you into silence, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, I wanna go over very quickly, and then I have a writing exercise after this uh, about the history of haiku, and we'll cover some of the main Japanese uh, haiku poets. So. Haiku sort of began 1300 years ago in Japan with something called uta, which means song. And it was a borrowed form that came from China. It was actually written in, ja- in Chinese characters. And if you know the, the history of the Japanese language, you know that a lot of the words are Chinese or they use Chinese characters. Uh, sometimes the meaning has changed of those words um, over the centuries, but there's a lot of Chinese kanji it's used in the Japanese language. And the uta or song also came from Japan, from China. Um, but over year, over the years, uta became waka, which means Japanese song. Wa is a particle that means specifically that this is now Japanese, meaning that they were now using these uh, poems, specifically using the Japanese language and not just Chinese from a thousand or 1300 years ago. And some people even say today that a waka, which uh, they say here later became known as, known as tanka, that the waka has to be written in Japanese and cannot be written in any language but Japanese. Um, that may be a little stringent, but the point of it was that it was trying, the word was trying to differentiate waka, the short poem, from the uta, which was the Chinese poem. Um, it was sort of, they were asserting themselves here. In developing their own language at the time. The waka had a pattern of 57577 seven, seven, most often. And uh, that is what is used in tanka in, J- in Japanese today, which is a much older form that haiku helped to influence. Again, 57577. Uh, five, seven, seven. Um, and that tanka just means short song. 
And in today, even today, in the imperial court, uh, the emperor and empress for New Year's Day, they have a tanka contest and the winners are chanted. And you can listen to recordings, it's on NHK uh, television of this performance of these selected poems out of many thousands, tens of thousands that are entered. And they're all chanted, they're still songs, um, even though they're poems as well, but they're treated as songs even after centuries. So years ago in the Imperial court, which is where most people, if you were, if you were literate and could read and write, uh, you were probably in the upper class and in the Imperial court. Commoners generally couldn't read and write. Uh, but in this context, they used what was called renga as a pastime. So somebody would write a three line, well, well in English is three lines, uh, a starting verse uh, called a hoku, which uh, I mentioned here too in this slide. The starting verse of a renga is called a hoku. And um, some, that was 575. And somebody wrote a response verse that was 7-7. Seven, seven. And then there was a 575, then another 7-7. Seven, seven. You had this alternation as a um, chain of poems. And there were particular rules, like there had to have a verb ending here or a flower verse here or a moon verse here and so on. Um, and certain tonal changes that you were allowed to use. It was very strict. Um, uh, and this is what they did before the internet um, for centuries. And it was very much a social activity, not a poetic activity. So it was considered social, not literature. And um, Stephen um, Carter has a book called Haiku Before Haiku, where he talks about all the poems that were written as renga over centuries. And he, it, it's startling to me. He said that there was an entire century in Japanese history where not a single entire renga was preserved because they were just social activities and thrown away. But starting verses were preserved or parts of the renga, but at least for one entire century, if you can imagine millions of renga being written at that time, not a single one has been preserved from one particular century. I think it's like the 12th century or 13th century, something like that, because um, it was a social pastime. But the key thing that affects us today in haiku is this idea of the hoku. Uh, when you were writing a renga, you write the starting verse, three lines in English, and then a two-liner response verse. And the idea is you link the previous verse in some way, but also shift away. And that's why it's a chain. You have this continual linking and shifting as you go through all the verses, taste all of life, which is the idea. But the hoku doesn't have anything to link to or shift away from. So that's where the two-part structure comes from in haiku, because the starting verse of Arenga puts that link and shift structure, that two-part structure into the single poem. And it's the only poem in Arenga that does that or is supposed to do that. Thereafter, even the three liners in English are not supposed to have that two part structure, which a lot of people think it should, as if thinking they're supposed to be haiku. But after the starting verse, none of the following verses are supposed to be haiku, meaning to have that two part structure. Um, but that's where the two part structure comes from. And usually the hoku is written about the current season uh, and, and it's complementary to the host, it's a traditional thing. So that's where the seasonal word comes from in haiku as well. Um, it comes straight out of the hoku, the starting verse of this link poem poetry called renga. A modern term for renga is renku as well. Um, so that's sort of in a nutshell where haiku came from and its development over hundreds of years in Japan. And, and yet all these short verses were not called haiku until about 120 years ago. It says 100 years ago, it's really 120 some um, uh, the poet Shiki uh, came up with the word haiku for this verse, hoping it would become an independent verse and no longer be limited to being associated with renga and linked verse. And he, he, it was very revolutionary uh, in the late 1800s for him to do this. But it, it also, some people say, it saved haiku and made it an international form, a form that is spread around the world or a genre, as I like to say. So uh, any questions on this before I move on? 
So, um, Basho was like uh, um, late 1400s when he uh, apparently was noted for having used haku as a, a form that didn't wasn't necessarily part of a His verses were part of uh, renga, right, predominantly, or prose and haiku, which is a form called haibun, and his travel diaries use that, that format. True? So speaking of Basho, here he is. Um, this is his most famous poem, Furuikiya Kauzu Tobikomu Mizuno Oto, or Old Pond frog leaps into the sound of water, or a frog leaps in the sound of water. So you have that refrigerator effect of the old pond is one part, and then the rest of it is, is the other part. Um, and something that's worth <laughs> noting about this poem is for centuries, uh, the Japanese court tradition was that if you were writing about a frog, the expectation was to write about the croaking of the frog sound of the frog itself. But here, he's doing a different kind of sound, the sound that it makes as it leaps into water. So this poem was actually pretty revolutionary. And in that sense, you could also, you could also imagine that the old pond is sort of a metaphor. This is, frog is disrupting the old ways of writing this sort of poetry. Um, so there's a revolution going on here that's not necessarily evident in the surface description of what's happening here. Um, so this is perhaps the most famous haiku in the entire world. Old pond, frog leaps, sound of water. There are various ways to interpret that in or into or leave it out. I think uh, Hiroaki Sato published a book with 100 different versions of that poem. Yes, uh, I think there were 140 by the time he finished. Um, <laughs> One, there's some in limerick form, some in sonnet form, and also various <laughs> translations uh, of, of this, like Jack Car or Allen Ginsberg's was something like pond, frog, plop. <laughs> and there are many variations. And it's, it's great, it's fun, there, it's fun to play with it. So uh, Basho was the first of the four great haiku masters in Japan. Uh, lived in the 1600s, and uh, it's followed by Busan, who was also well known for being a, a haiga artist. Haiga is haiku painting, where you paint a picture uh, and use the same brush to do calligraphy of the poem on the same uh, piece of paper. And he was, uh, if he wasn't a haiku poet, he'd be a national, he is a national treasure just for his paintings, but he was also talented with haiku. And I love this poem his evening breeze water laps the legs blue heron um, it's a very quiet poem but it's very subtle noticing and um, very painterly I think you can picture this very clearly it's a beautiful beautiful image Isa was the uh, next great master he lived in the 1700s to the 1800s um, he had an extremely hard life um, his mother died, he was kicked out of the house. Uh, uh, his, he had a series of children die, his house burned down. It's all sorts of things, sort of like a Job character. Uh, but he still wrote these beautifully sensitive poems, often about small insects, and is uh, very deeply loved in Japan because of this. Uh, and this is my all-time favorite of haiku in Japanese, snow melting. The village is flooded with children. Great. And I love this surprise of that last line. And apparently this, this double meaning of flooded is present in the Japanese too, where you think, oh no, the village is flooded. No, he means it in a different way. Flooded with children <laughs> because they're all eager to go outside and play in the melting snow and enjoy the warming weather. Um, I just love the attitude of this poem. Uh, he's a very joyful poet despite despite all the calamities that happened to him. And then of course there's Shiki, uh, who reformed haiku with a series of essays more than a hundred years ago and helped to make it an independent 
form and uh, get it out of its doldrums of, of, of stultified tradition. Uh, and this is a favorite poem of his, Summer River. There's a bridge, but the horse goes through water. What's left out of this poem is how hot it must be. that Even the horse would prefer to go to the, through the cooling water than over the bridge. Uh, so there's, there's empathy going on here. Um, empathy for the horse and how hot it must be. And of course, that's the unstated thing in the poem. Um, and it's nicely done. Um, the, uh, Shiki was also a fan of baseball and wrote the very first baseball haiku uh, in the 1800s. And believe it or not, he's actually in the Baseball Hall of Fame in Japan because he loved uh, baseball so much and helped promote it um, as well as haiku, even though he was not a baseball player himself. Uh, he died very young of, of tuberculosis. Of too. Uh, say that again? Cor, Cor Vandenovo, big baseball yes, he haiku had, fan. Yes, uh, he, uh, he has a book called Baseball Haiku from Norton that includes uh, Shiki's baseball haiku at the start of the book and talks about that, that uh, influence mm. and has many other haiku in English um, about baseball. It's a very seasonal game, boys of summer. Um, uh, almost any, any baseball term sort of serves as a, as a season word. So although I say there's four haiku masters, it's actually a fifth. She doesn't get nearly the credit she deserves, Chioni. And I love this poem of hers, Morning Glory. Well bucket entangled, I ask for water. Uh, she appreciates the uh, beauty of the Asagao, the morning glory that she's holding in her hand in that picture. Um, uh, and it's, you know, how they tangle themselves overnight or whenever. Um, and she leaves it be, and gets water elsewhere instead of at, at her usual well. And there's something um, very honoring of nature in that poem. Um, and if it's hard to find, but uh, uh, Patricia Donegan has a, a, a book of Chionese poems that I highly recommend. And this picture is actually the one that's on the cover of the book. So just quickly about the contemporary haiku in Japan, um, this statistic is a little dated from 2006, but there's a, an almanac called the Karakawa Haiku Almanac. And back then there were 835 known haiku groups Japan. And I think the number has gone down since then, I've been told, uh, but it's still pretty close to that. But each of them has hundreds or even thousands of members. And uh, the three largest groups uh, have about 5,000 to 15,000 members each. Uh, so the scale of haiku in Japan is very different than it is here in, in North America. And they typically hold what's called a kukai or monthly meeting. And the poems are chosen anonymously. And then those poems get published in their usually monthly or quarterly journal. And the largest journal uh, that I know of is Hototogisu, um, which was started by Shiki in the 1800s. It's still being published. Um, uh, I've seen copies of Hototogisu in, in Japan where they're available like Time Magazine on a newsstand. Um, and they're literally 350 pages. And each monthly issue contains 10,000 bloody haiku. I ain't reading all that many haiku, sorry. Um, but of course, you look for your group and you read the poems by your group if it's represented in the, in the anthology or other groups that you know of. Um, but yeah, I can't imagine reading that many haiku uh, every month, my goodness. Um, and uh, uh, there are also haiku shows on TV and radio. And if any of you get NHK, Comcast, you can see some of the, the shows. Or if you get the Japanese channels, you can see them in Japanese. There are occasionally English shows. Um, it uh, recently ran for a few years, the uh, Haiku Masters show in English was on NHK and that was in English, but there are many shows in Japanese uh, as well. Um, and some of you may know the Itoen contest that gives $5,000 equivalent for a single haiku. Um, and there are many other contests, uh, thousands of contests probably. And uh, uh, Newspapers carry haiku columns uh, 
and these go to millions of people. Uh, so it's, yeah, and there's millions of people who write haiku uh, every month. It's just huge scale compared to what we have here. Um, uh, and yet, um, I will say, my, my wife is Japanese, and I love quoting her when she says this, that haiku is something that old people do. Uh, that's her impression of it in, in Japan. And I think it's true. They're, they tend to be older than most people who write haiku in English. Um, but it's, it's, a big, it's a much bigger deal in, in Japan and uh, becoming a bigger deal around the world. So it's fun to be part of. Um, but in a way, I'm glad I don't speak Japanese because then suddenly, I, I mean fluently, uh, and then because I'd be ma massively overwhelmed with millions of haiku books that I suddenly would feel obliged to read. Uh, hard enough to keep up in English. All right, so uh, I love this quote too. We're going to shift gears in a moment. Haiku has this rather phantasmagorical property that we also always suppose we ourselves can write such things easily. And I think when we look at haiku, whether we've read them or written them ourselves or not, um, they can look so simple, uh, but it's 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 can be really hard to, to put all the pieces together, to hit all the targets. Um, but that's what we aim for. Uh, and that's what I hope we, we've been able to explore today. Um, but I also recognize that this can be really intimidating. Um, I've just filled up your cup of haiku and you just maybe don't know what to do with it all, or you feel like it's, um, it's too much to juggle, too much to think of. Uh, of all these targets and balancing them all at once in writing your poem. And in reaction to that, I would say, let it go. Think of one target to aim at, um, to capture a personal experience, to capture a feeling. Or you might say, oh, I'm gonna write poems that are about autumn or about food, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, uh, Pick, your, pick a target you want to aim at. Give that attention. Um, and then maybe try to add one other target to it. Or maybe you're okay with starting with two targets to think of um, and see where it goes. Um, it, it can be overwhelming to think of all the targets at once. Um, but uh, to the extent that we're able to share and discuss in the time we have left, I hope we can think about some of the targets. But don't forget to return to that idea of you don't have to do all of them at once. Um, do one or two um, and, and see if you feel comfortable that way. Otherwise, they can feel overwhelming. Um, any questions about that before we switch gears? Or any other comments? Mm -mm. Okay, let's move on. So let's try writing haiku. And um, uh, there, I actually have a variation of what's written on the screen. It's more food oriented and I'll get to it in a second. But think in terms of food and think of these questions. Take a few moments to think of an experience from your day today or in the last week. Write down something from your, day, your, your daily life that you <laughs> smelled, heard, tasted, tasted or touched, et cetera. And you could describe that experience maybe in prose, a short sentence uh, or half a sentence, and then put it with another sentence that comes to you at the same time, um, maybe giving it a seasonal context. Maybe I'm loading you up with too many targets to aim for here, but see what you can do with it. Um, I'm gonna stop and share for a second because I wanna look up something else um, that I have on my, my screen. Um, just a second here. I've got this right thing in front of me here. Um, so, more food specifically, um, I'm going to uh, paste this into the chat. Just a second. Okay, so um, 
I'd like us to name favorite foods. It's our theme of the Virgilio Society's food at the moment. Um, and think of places where you might eat this food and um, uh, think about something you could say about this food that isn't necessarily about taste. Um, so let's start with just brainstorming. Let, name a favorite food. Go ahead. Ice cream. Okay, ice cream. So if you can write a haiku about ice cream, there's your prompt right there. Um, Name more food, favorite foods. Flounder. <clears throat> Sorry? Flounder, fish. Flounder, okay. Uh, and that sushi. leads to, sorry? Oh, sushi. Sushi, all right, which is also kind of, <laughs> kind of fish. Um, but and both of those can lead, lead you to think about where would you eat a flounder or sushi? Um, are you by the seashore, a restaurant? Um, are you filleting the fish, you know, at a campfire? Um, that's the way you can develop a haiku from from just that simple food beginning. Other favorite foods? In this season, it would have to be pumpkins. Pumpkins, okay. Pumpkin pie. And then, then you can think Thanksgiving, uh, lots of directions you can go with that. No one's mentioned beetroot yet. Mentioned what? Beetroot. Crip steak. <laughs> <laughs> what was that, Henry? Crip steak. Strip <laughs> okay. York, strip steak. <laughs> okay. Um, other favorite foods too? Lasagna I'm seeing in the chat. Pizza. I'll go with pizza. Okay. <laughs> All right. So for your own list, um, think about, um, well, so oh, the question was, which are seasonal? So pumpkin is very seasonal. And I also think of rhubarb. Um, is a very, for me, it's a very seasonal fall, late summer kind of uh, food. And I remember used to have rhubarb when I was a kid in Canada used to have rhubarb growing in this one spot in the backyard. And uh, my mother would harvest it uh, periodically. Uh, and we'd figure out how, how sweet or bitter it was. Um, and we'd usually dip it in sugar and just eat it raw. Um, but it, it really needed to be dipped in sugar. And I remember that. I remember that in the fall, early fall, we would do that every year. Um, what are some other- Don't eat the green part. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, so, what are some other seasonal foods you can think of? Apples. Uh, persimmons. Persimmons. Okay. Yeah. Yes. What season would you put persimmons? Autumn. Right. right. Fall. Okay. Well, persimmons a good prompt. It's got so many tart, um, alamy, different things going on. Blueberry or. Blueberries, Concord I like it. Grapes. Concord grapes. Okay. Um, I think a lot of foods have autumn associations because of harvest. Or at least that's my gut feeling. You'd harvest more at the end of the summer or autumn. Uh, at least for eating them. But some of them may have like I think of persimmons left over in a tree. It's a very wintry sort of image, but all the leaves have fallen. I remember seeing them in Japan this way, but all the leaves have fallen and all you see is this shriveling fruit left in the tree in December, I mean, sorry, January or February. Um, I don't know, other seasonal foods you can think of. Lemons. Okay, and what season do you think of for that? California is too confusing. I guess I think winter because they seem to do better in the winter in some places, but our lemon okay. tree goes all year round, so it's a little confusing. Yeah, 
And that, that is actually something worth pointing out about seasonal reference. In Japan, the seasons are a little bit more limited. Like, um, an example would be dry grass. You know, that might be winter in some parts of the United States, uh, but it's summer in other parts. Um, I don't know. Um, so you'd have to be true to whatever is local for you, I think. So what I'd like us to do is- Snow um, peas. Snow peas, I like that. Um, think of, make a list for yourself or expand on your list or maybe you, you're done and you can stop. Um, and think of where you could eat that food and think of a place for that food. And then write a, write a haiku about a memory of that food or place um, and see what you can come up with. So taste is, is, is most likely what's going to be part of the poem, but it doesn't have to be. I mean, think of chili peppers in a bowl. It's visual and that's fine. Um, where might that happen? And what, might else, what else might be going on when you see that? Um, uh, and see what you can do. Um, so should we take, is five minutes enough time or longer? Try writing. Let's take five. That sounds good. Okay. And um, then we could share our poems only if you want to. Um, completely optional. Um, you could type them into chat uh, or, or just say them, whatever you prefer. Um, or if you say them, maybe somebody else can type them. I could try typing them in. Um, and then we can talk about them. Um, so let's take, see, it's 9.05. It's not too late there, is it? It's just fine. Okay, um, let's go till 9.10 uh, Eastern time and uh, see, what, see what happens. I'm gonna take a short break. I'm gonna get a glass of water.
Need a bit more time. <laughs> if you're ready, maybe wave. A bit more time for the rest of you. So if, um, if you'd like to share, try doing that. First, a question. Is this hard? Yeah. Yeah. OK. Hard for me, too. It's supposed to be hard. I had one straight out of real life today. We came down this morning, and, and we found our pumpkin out front cracked in half. So the poem, first poem was, Smashed pumpkin, roasting it for my dinner plate. Smashed oh, pumpkin, roasting it for my dinner plate. That's nice. Okay. So, some okay. of them, so thinking about process here, some of them just leap out at you and they can come easily. Um, like that one. Say it one more time. Smashed pumpkin, roasting it for my dinner plate. Okay, so it's it's very much an immediate immediate memory, and it's fairly it's fairly Pretty close. Concrete. Yeah, it's concrete and close to you, so it's easier to write about. Mm -hmm. um, as you begin to think about memory, um, it can be perhaps less close, but still be vibrant. Henry, you were going to say something. Ice cream after the lecture, short poems. <laughs> Um, short, short, like how long ice cream lasts, right? <laughs> kind of, yeah. So, if this is this whole exercise is hard for some of some of us, why would you say that is? Let's unpack that a little bit while we're still oh, share about to share our poems. Oh. Why is this hard? Yeah, it's Comparison um, to a pitfall, that's what it is. Um, I think for me, it's uh, not knowing what to 
in uh, what detail to include and what to leave out. Uh, I wrote, leaving Zoom meeting before turning pumpkin, autumn sunset. <laughs> okay. Are you about to turn into a pumpkin? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you, you're in you're in California, aren't you? Uh, yeah, right? I'm in California. So it's Still only in six, California. It's only six fifteen there then. <laughs> Long okay, way from being yeah. being being a pumpkin. <laughs> I'm gonna go to bed very early. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I do know from various Zoom meetings that with time changes or time differences. Uh, right. I've gotten up really early in the morning or stayed up <laughs> really late sometimes. Um, and it's part of the fun. <laughs> um, so say your poem again, Jackie. Leaving Zoom meeting before turning pumpkin, autumn sunset. So although I'm teasing you about the time, what, what you really mean is mean it more metaphorically it's not it doesn't have to be late but you just um no yeah yeah um so um your last line mentions a season and pumpkin right. can also suggest the season but you mean pumpkin okay. on a metaphor you mean met pumpkin as a metaphor not necessarily turning pumpkin as a metaphor not as a literal pumpkin so the mention of autumn yeah. is your real season word there, not pumpkin. I like the way that turns two ways, that there's the slang phrase turning into a pumpkin at the end of the day when you're tired and then turning pumpkin color. It, it, that, that double meaning really works for me. Yeah. Uh, but should haiku be more concrete and less uh, metaphorical? Well, hmm. sometimes or we could have both. It could be both. I I think, um, I think I think if they begin on a literal level, start with that's better. Um, oh, okay. You can, you can have you can have a metaphorical yeah. or conceptual haiku occasionally, um, but not often. Um, hmm. Or an individual poem might have part conceptual ideas in it and part experience an image um leaving the zoom meeting is um, um it's an experience but not something you can you can hold in your hand um and oh, that's fine okay. it's still it's still an experience but you can't hold it in your hand um and it's fine right. you can just be aware of the different kinds of images that you have in the haiku mm. okay um and you know there is a literal sunset in your poem, and that is something you can experience through your five senses. Um, right. And so that grounds the poem. And that's that's what what really helps with the poem because the rest of it is is more more intellectualized. Um, or or uh, like before turning pumpkin. That that's a, a phrase that tells us that you're doing it before it gets too late, kind of thing, or that maybe you're tired. <laughs> But the sunset <laughs> is the actual image that grounds the poem. So I think that's an important part okay. of the poem. Hmm. Alan? So um, I'll read it and then I'll ask a question later. After lunch walk on shortcut path, huge rotting lemon smashed. Say it again. Mm. After lunch, walk on shortcut path. Huge rotting lemon smashed. Okay, I'm typing it into the chat, if that's okay. Um, after lunch, walk on shortcut path. Is that the first line? Uh, no, after lunch, walk is the first line. On shortcut path is the second line. And then what's after that? Huge rotting lemon smashed. Okay. Uh, I just pasted that in the chat and I see Gordon, uh, your poem too, we'll get to yours in a moment. Um, so did you have a question about it, Alan? 
Well, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, but the person from Nick Virgilio had a smashed pumpkin. Right. And then I had a smashed lemon and I was thinking, we're, we're living in the wrong era here. But anyway, I'm not trying to bring that in, but I'm just thinking smashing is kind of, kind of a problem. <laughs> then I thought, should I take out smashing? Well, the whole deal of my sensory memory is the smashing and you know whatever it's connected to. So then I didn't want to take it out, but it's kind of, it kind of feels like a lot of stuff in the last line to me. So um, I, I guess I don't have enough experience with growing lemons to, to relate to this poem more deeply. Um, so I'm not seeing why it's smashed or why here. Is it growing on a tree and why would it be next to a shortcut path? So I'm trying to figure that out. Um, so that's I see. Well, no, it's, a, it's actually fallen from the tree. So that wasn't clear, I guess. And it was. Well, smashed. it's on the path. It's yeah. on the path. So I get that the lemon is on the ground. Okay. But fallen from what? Um, uh, it could be the lemon tree is by the path, but um, I have to figure that out a little bit. Um, so one thing I would point out is. Um, there's a, an impetus when writing haiku to try and make it short. Um, and some people say to make it as short as possible. I disagree with that. I think you should make it as short as necessary. <laughs> different yeah. from short as possible. And a, a, a way to illustrate this, um, uh, you say on shortcut path. And it, it's slightly unnatural for English. You'd, you'd more likely say on the shortcut path and just add the article or on a shortcut path. And I would, I would include those words, even though it makes the poem longer. They're practically invisible words, but I think they're natural and normal. So there's no reason to omit them. And a similar feeling happens with the first line after lunch walk. It feels a little bit like a telegram. Um, and I think you could use, um, um, my lunch walk on the shortcut path. That reads as one phrase. And then you have the shift to whatever your refrigerator line is, in this case, the rotting lemon. Um, but you see that structure and the, the, the natural use of language. Sometimes you can get away with the articles in the first line when it's a fragment by itself. Um, uh, but often it's better to include the articles after that. Or or say my or her or something instead of the article. Um, does that help? It does. Um, I actually, I like what you did because I had after hyphen lunch, you know, like it's an after lunch walk. I like yours is cleaner. And the name of the path is shortcut path, but it's better to just have it be on a shortcut path. Okay. Because then it's more, it's more generic for everybody to kind of get it. Yeah, uh, and I forgot to type the hyphen when I was typing typing it in. Sorry well, about that. That's okay. I mean, you're, the point you're making is well, I don't know what your point you were making about. I have to let you make the point. My lunch walk is is just making it again more universal or something, as well yeah. as specific. At the I same think so. time, yeah, I think so. Um, let's try and catch up with some of the other poems. Yeah. Um, um, back up to Gordon's poem. Uh, I smiled at this one. First sip of my cappuccino, new mustache. I love it. <laughs> um, um, you could literally have be growing an actual mustache that's your first mustache, but that's not what you mean. It means to fall from the cappuccino, uh, and I love that. Um, uh, so I, I love the humor. Uh, I love the food component, drink counts. Um, uh, now, if if you think about all those targets we talked about, um, 
there we have a two part structure. Uh, so I love the shift that goes on. In this case, it's marked by the by the dash um, where that cut is. Um, it's very concrete and sensory. Uh, we can see this. We can almost taste it. Um, there's a shift and turn to the to the second part, which is good. Um, I don't think there's any seasonal reference here, unless cappuccino is seasonal in a way that I don't know. Um, uh, but that's okay. I don't think it needs to have it. I wouldn't try to force a seasonal reference on, onto a poem like this. Um, <clears throat> that's where you can damage it. Um, so it's choosing not to hit that seasonal. Does this feel fair to say, Gordon? That you're choosing not to aim at this seasonal reference? I think you're muted. Maybe um, <clears throat> there are catch-up with new messages here. Um, yeah, uh, Gordon in chat says uh, no seasonal references is intentional, and I that's a good choice for this poem. Um, it has that immediacy and clarity that needs no further change. I, I just wouldn't touch it. Um, uh, well, actually, one thought does occur to me. Um, uh, it's the use of my. Uh, it could be the other way around. My first sip of the cappuccino and maybe move up down to the next line. Um, my first sip of the cappuccino, you must ask. I'm thinking aloud here, I'm not saying that's better. I'm just wondering if that's something to consider. Um, or uh, a little just bit more compressed, maybe first sip of her cappuccino, you mustache. That changes it. Yeah. Um, so there's, there's things you can play with, but you don't necessarily need to change it. Yeah. Any other I thoughts think, on this? Go ahead, Rick. Yeah, I, I think having of uh, and the first line seems unnatural. I think that should be at the beginning of the second line. Either way, whether it's first sip or my first sip, but I think of my cappuccino is a complete thought more yeah. than having the first line end on of. Usually the last word of a line is emphasized. And to put it on of is sort of on the wrong beat. Um, and it becomes in usefully invisible if you move a word like of down to the next line. Um, then you have more emphasis on sip. And it's it's a stronger beat visually as well as the sound yeah. of it. Yeah. 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 And I love the P of uh, repetition sound, sip and cappuccino. So sip is beautifully chosen there. Yeah. Um, yeah, very nice. Yep. Um, let's go to Henry's poem. In the garden, writing haiku, fallen mulberries. <coughs> Your thoughts, oh. anyone, on the on this poem? I love it because you when you let your poems go, they're kind of like the fallen mulberries. They've done their job and they're out there, and whatever they're going to be in the world, smashed or loved isn't in your control. Um, I was thinking, um, well, it's, it's actually an experience I've had and it happened at the Nick Virgilio writer's house. And we had a huge mulberry fall. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, I moved to it because um, there was a, a student of Basho who grew persimmons and the only reason he became a haiku poet, one of Basho's favorites, is because the night before he was going to sell his persimmons, and the storm came down from the mountain and knocked them all off the tree. And that's when he gave up being a persimmon farmer. And his house is still there in Japan, and it's called the House of Fallen Persimmons. So there you go. Yeah. Did you um, say, anyway, that's sort of the inspiration. I'm sorry, could you say the poem again? Because I, I can't scroll back up and see it in the chat. I don't know what I'm doing here. Uh, um, in the garden, yeah. I'll do it. In the garden, writing haiku, fallen mulberries. 
Yeah. So That's I don't nice. know. I don't know mulberries well enough to know what seasonal time this would be, but fall. Am I right? Not, well, it's not actually. They don't fall in, in the fall. So I suppose that might be um, confusing. That well, that's fall, just me because I don't know. I don't know when they would fall. They fall in oh. midsummer. Okay, so then this is a summer palm. Summer, you're basically a summer palm, yes. Okay. Um, and I love the the overtone for those who know the the story from Japan. That this would add to it, um, uh, even though it's. Uh, you're choosing to write about mulberries instead. Um, it's very uh, simple, pure. Uh, and that's a good word for haiku. There's a purity to a good haiku. It's just sort of like, it's got no unnecessary parts um, and yet says enough, but not too much. It finds yeah. a sweet spot. Um, uh, and there's natural line breaks and so on in what, in what you've shared here. Any other comments or thoughts on it? So let's go to Jackie's poem. Um, I'll read it. Uh, Persimmons, How Time Ripens, My Once Green Heart. Persimmons, How Time Ripens, My Once Green Heart. Mm. And I'm reading those last two lines together because I take well, you could read how time ripens as an independent thought, but I like how it can be read into the next line as well, how it ripens my one screen heart. Um, and yet you could read them independently. My, how time ripens is an independent thought, and then my one screen heart could be another independent thought, but I like the energy of the two of them together. Um, and then all of that juxtaposes just for Simmons. Um, is, it's a very thoughtful, uh, aware, awareness of how you emotionally respond to the persimmons. Um, there's, a bit of, there's a bit of um, sadness. I don't know if this is fair. My once mm. green heart, it's, it's a bit of nostalgia. Maybe nostalgia is the word I'm looking for, not sadness. Yeah. I don't know. All I can that? think of it is eating an unripe pers persimmon is quite. Um, couldn't hear everything you said, Henry. Uh, Jackie, how does does nostalgia feel like a right word for your poem or not? Uh, I'm sorry. Does nostalgia? Oh, okay. Let me go back. To does nostalgia feel like a right uh, way to yes, respond to of. your hype? Sort of. Uh, I think so. I'm always thinking about the past, so I think that's uh, definitely an appropriate uh, interpretation. Okay. Um, the. One thing, I, there's there's a sort of subjectivity that goes on in those second and third lines, how time ripens my one screen heart. It's sort of a you're, something you're thinking. But again, it's grounded in the very clear Maybe image of persimmon. Um, I think that's the strength of the poem. You, 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 you have it grounded in something you can experience. Okay, thank you. Any other thoughts on this one from anyone or questions? Persimmons. I found it really touching, and I, I don't think I can articulate why, but as soon as I read it, I felt it. Yeah, it has a slightly uh, Tonka-ish feel. Tonka tend to be a bit more subjective mm. like this. Um, um, and it doesn't mean haiku can't do that, but it, it, Tonka will do this all the time. Um, uh, and I, oh. I wouldn't, try to, I wouldn't yeah. try to make it longer or anything just to be a Tonka. But it has a slight Tonka feel to it. Yeah. Okay. Um, Mary. Okay, hi. I have a million versions, but I came down with this one. Salt, air, and flounder. 
stir in the full moon, an appetite for more. Mm, wow. Say it, say it again. Salt, air, and flounder, stir in the full moon, an appetite for more. But I also said things like, um, delicious together. And, uh, um, dig uh, dig digesting together or something like that. Anyway, I wrote it all a few different ways. And, and that's the way haiku evolved. Um, I tend to work them out of my head a lot before I write them down. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I know others that have like 10 versions that they've written down because uh, that's their process. So whatever works for you. What do the rest of you like like about this poem? How vivid the sense of the sea is. There is nothing like a full moon by the ocean. It had a recipe quality, which is cool, even though it's not exactly a recipe. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's the word stir that gives that sense. I yeah. love the idea of stirring in the full moon. That is that is wonderful. And it's, a, it's like an instruction too. Take your salt yeah. air and your flounder, stir in the full moon, this is your recipe. So that's where the recipe idea comes from, I think. Um, Mary, what were your other last lines? You said you had a few? Well, they were really beginning lines, like oh, okay. flounder, um, okay. From under the fishing pier. Like just, I couldn't get past flounder. I was stuck on that word, I mean, it feels better to me to couple it with salt air. Mm -hmm. But before I did that, I was flounder um, from under the fishing pier to my plate. Um, and something about becoming dinner. Or, at, and I was thinking of the fish being at home under the fishing pier becomes dinner as the moon glows, <laughs> all those kinds of things. But about the flounder being under the water as I'm sitting on the fishing pier and eventually it arrives on my plate and <laughs> all that stuff. So I didn't think I'd ever come up with anything in just three lines. <laughs> so thank you for pushing me into it. You've got many seeds um, for haiku, many different yeah, haikus you could possibly do. Okay. Go ahead, Jackie. Mm -hmm. Now, earlier we were talking about sound, and I just, I love the way the haiku, her haiku sounds. Um, just uh, the use of language, I, I really like it. And Gordon is typing in the chat that he loves the contrast of small and large, and loves mm -hmm. the moon imagery, likes the process mm -hmm. of how you got there. Um, um, so, one thing I'm conscious of in the poem is that it has um, three parts. And they feel independent to me. And mm -hmm. my first inclination might be to see about giving the poem no more than two parts. Um, and I'm not sure how to do that. What um, about after stir in doing a line break and the full moon is the last line? Mm -hmm. So that would do it. Um, so in a, in a way, an appetite for more is your intellectual interpretation for the, of this. Mm -hmm. And when I talked earlier, when I talked about don't write about your emotions or ideas, say, mm -hmm. write about what caused them. And what's causing them is the first two lines in this poem. And then the third line, an appetite for more, is really an idea and reaction to this. And in a way, you could take that out. So I love the suggestion. Salt air and flounder, stir in the full moon. That's all you need. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, um, it's such a beautiful idea to stir in the full moon. <laughs> this, this, yeah. This, this recipe. My favorite part, stir in the full moon is a great yeah. line. Yeah. yeah. And through that, I know that you said flounder was uh, your favorite food and the reason why you wrote this poem. But to me, it would be more effective if it was something that you could actually stir the moon into, lobster. Mm -hmm. 
some kind of seafood chowder or something because oh, yeah. it, stirring the stirring something huh. into the flounder is kind of difficult but right. it's not difficult in a bisque or a soup or something that's more liquidy so i don't mean to throw that bomb into your poem but it would make yeah. more sense on that level to me i did think of that too that you can't stir flounder yeah it's but totally i read it anyway so for the for the sake of the poem, the idea of a bisque of some kind might be a, a way to go. Um, and the flounder might be a way to get there, even if you have to take it out. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, stirring in the full moon is beautiful. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's really great. Yep. Um, the, the appetite for more, by taking that out, I think it's totally clear that we're hungry. We want more <laughs> without your even saying it. Well, thanks. I'll try to see if I can come up with another last line or no last line. I like it without a last line. Okay, lots of possibilities. And um, are you familiar with Haibun, Erin? With what? Haibun? No. So Haibun is prose sprinkled with haiku and oh. you could tell us tell a story of being at this particular location in prose in a short paragraph and then end with the poem so all those details you were talking about could be described in a prose paragraph and then shift away to whatever the poem focuses on it's hopefully distinct from everything you said in the prose would that be another way you could go you could go with it okay so tell you could tell the story or provide more of a setting in a a paragraph of prose and it could be two or three sentences that's all or it could be longer and mm -hmm. then shift to the haiku and you sort of you sort of tighten the screw on us and here's what you want to focus on and that's mm -hmm. uh, it's like a knot hole in, the, in a, a plank of wood you know that's what you focus on okay um, thank Rick, you you had a poem Rick? Rick did you have a poem to share Rick? Me? Yes. Do you have one to share? Uh, well, yeah, and I'll preface it by saying that I never work this way. I, <laughs> I don't work with writing. I'm a walking poet. I walk, I write while I'm out in nature. They have to hit me. So I, I never sit around and try to remember things or think of things. But uh, I, I gave it my best shot, and this is what I came from. <laughs> so all day rain the last piece of pecan pie oh. over the And again? The last, all day rain, the last piece of pecan pie, overly sweet. Or sickeningly sweet, or some other <laughs> kind of sweet, but just way too sweet. <laughs> I just reacted as soon as you got to the word pie. It felt complete to me right there. Yes. <laughs> all day rain the last piece of pecan pie yeah. I, I actually like that i felt That's like enough. i i felt like i'm stuck in the house and there's no joy here and i've finished the last joy there is i'm just stuck yeah i didn't think of that i like it <laughs> i reacted so, like when you got to there i thought you were at the end so i just pasted in both versions in the chat um okay. yeah. and pecan pie is my favorite pie and my family all think it's sickeningly <laughs> sweet but I have a sweet tooth. <laughs> so um, for for this being not your normal process, I'd say this is this is works great. Yeah. Um, with, I'd take out I, yeah. I don't think you need this sickeningly sweet because I think the rest of it is just great. All day rain. And here you are, thanks to this all day rain at the last piece. Um, maybe you've been eating the pie all day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Or, I mean, maybe it's just you wish you could have been eating the pie all day, but there's only one piece left. So there's that, that, there's that tension of which meaning is it for me. Um, and this, I love the uh, interiorness of it um, and, and the comfort that comes from the pie, regardless of how sweet it is. <laughs> Any other thoughts? Anyone?
So Annette, um, I know your video is off, but do you have a poem to say to us or type into the chat? Can you hear us, Annette? I don't think not. she's yeah, I don't think she's on there. Okay. Yeah, just unmuted. So we should be able to hear now. No. If you're there, Annette, feel free to paste your poem into chat or start start speaking if you like. Uh, if you'd rather not share, that's fine too. Um, Henry has a second poem here. Mm, yeah. you want to read it for us, Henry? Sure. Grandmother, her Concord grapes, what's left of her. I um, actually never knew my grandmother, but she planted uh, this farm I grew up on with Concord grapes and pear trees that are 60 feet tall now and persimmons and peaches and all kinds of stuff. I could go around and eat lunch uh, and never come home until dinner time. And well, I just uh, remembered uh, about the Concord grapes when you said, what kind of food do we like? So, uh, you, know, that, you know, it's sort of like the wine of my grandmother is, uh, in my memory here with the Concord grapes. So I love the, the story that, that these grapes are what left are what's left of what she planted and so on. Um, uh, when she died know, before I was born, that's uh, part of the way I said what's left of her. So that detail, I think, really makes the poem click into place, but I'm not sure if it's it's not in the poem itself. I wonder if there's a way to make that clearer. Mm. Um, and I think there's something else that might need attention that could give you space. And that's that grandmother, you tell us that, and then you say her, which repeats grandmother. So say perhaps again, say, Michael. So you say okay. grandmother, tell us that once, and then you say her, which points to grandmother again. So you could take out, you could say that's a kind of redundancy. What's left, so yeah. You could say grandmother's okay. Concord grapes. That could be one line, what's left that of her. Be. And yes. you still got another line you could add to the poem. Oh, yeah. Right, right. Just by compressing the her re reference. And uh, um, you, you can say that. I'm just kind of like, oh, it's too many syllables. <laughs> so so unpacking. Line. I mean, yeah, okay, so maybe it's all too long, but let's see what we can do. Um, um, grandmother, I never knew. Her Concord grapes, yes, I've all used that's that left. Before. So, something like that, uh, maybe to winnow it down a bit if it needs it. It's too long. Yeah, um, I wrote a poem about the pear trees once. It was more like. Um, grandmother's pears and they were you know we go there you can't pick them at 60 feet tall you have to wait for them to fall down <laughs> and uh, they're sort of like moldering in the ground the same as she is anyway the poem was about you know grandmother's pears um, I didn't use the word moldering but I kind of compared her in the ground to the pears but uh, I can't remember the way I wrote it exactly. But anyway, it's in there. It's funny, the people who um, you're related to these don't know how they live. Thank you. Um, Alan just had to leave. Um, if any of you Her mother, need to... I never knew, yes. Or conquered grapes, or conquered grapes, what's left. So let's keep playing with that. Um, yeah. Um, I think if we all try to wrap up in the next 10 or 15 minutes, that might be good. It's, I know it's getting a little late for some of you. Um, but this was fun. So Robin, you have a poem. Let's look at yours. Want to read it for us? 
Sure. A grandma's photo, the warm scent of cinnamon apples. Grandma's photo, the warm scent of cinnamon apples. Mm. So I like I like the idea that it's um, is this a photo of grandma or a photo of the apples? Like oh, uh, that's, that's true. It could be either. Yeah, it could be either. Um, and and the funny thing for me was that it set an expectation that the warm scent would be the scent of her perfume of her or of her, but really the dominant memory of my grandmother is that apple pie she made. Uh, yeah. yeah. So. Grandma's photo um, um, could be a photo of whatever that she owns. Mm -hmm. Or do you mean a photo of grandma? I meant a photo of grandma. Right. Would it be, I think that's that's sort of, it's definitely an option in, when you say grandma's photo. But if you want to be more certain of your intent, yep. I wonder if photo of grandma yep. might be make that clearer. It will make it clearer, yep. Um, and yet, and yet there's sort of a, slows it down a little bit. Something yeah. quicker about grandma's photo, isn't there? Yeah, and there's also two ofs that way too, which is awkward. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Maybe I'm picking on something that doesn't need to be picked on. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it's, I, it's clear I, enough. I, I love the juxtaposition of like, because to me, it seems like it's obviously an old black and white or a sepia photo of someone yeah. that's fading and then the real present scent of cinnamon apples. I, I love the juxtaposition there. That's wonderful. And, and actually, I was so backing up on what I was saying earlier. If you say photo of grandma, you lose the double possibility of is that photo of grandma or of the apples? Uh, so right. I think leaving it as grandma's photo is a better choice after all. I, I did this one largely because one of the first recipes in our food and haiku project that we're posting online is a cinnamon apple recipe that is very simple that even kids can do. So I wanted to make sure that one of the poems out of the workshop sparked off the recipe that's going up. Ah, good. Yes. So you but had it an came, ulterior. As soon as I thought cinnamon apple, though, there was grandma. So it was easy. So you had an ulterior motive with your haiku. Indeed. <laughs> um, it's very, very sensory. I mean, I can, I want some, <laughs> please. <laughs> I expect it in the mail next week. <laughs> um, um, and I'm, I'm imagining a pie, but it's not a pie. Um, the scent really came from her pie, but I didn't put all those okay. words in. Yeah, okay. Um, it certainly is an overtone for me and that, that works. Um, mm -hmm. <coughs> um, I wanted to share what I came up with. Um, All I came up with was a lemonade stand in a gentle rain. And I haven't got a, either a first or third line, unfortunately. Um, maybe I needed more time for it, but um, I was somehow taken, I forget who suggested lemons. Was that you, Rick? Mm -hmm. um, no. Oh, no, it was... Um, was someone it? said lemons. Yes. Um, and I went to lemonade yeah. and I imagined lemonade stand and I thought, well, let's make it sad. So let's put it left over in a gentle rain. And then I had nothing more to say. And that happens with haiku sometimes is get an image or call it a half a haiku. And it can be really hard to find the right juxtaposition. If you want and, to have a fun adventure, go to the Rutgers Nick Virgilio site where they have scanned the hundreds of pages of his efforts to complete his haiku. So you'll find a first line followed by 12 different couplets, and then you'll find two of those couplets morphed with different last lines. You'll find his writing process in full display. It's yeah. really amazing. And, and that's 
a similar process I go through. I don't write it down quite like that, but um, the, the art of finding that right juxtaposition, that shifting away, yet connecting line is still the hardest thing to do. And I've been writing haiku <coughs> for decades, but that's still the hardest thing. And so I like, I like what I've got, a lemonade stand and a gentle rain or variations thereof. What to put with it, I, I haven't figured out. Um, Michael? Um, yes? How about a bitter rain? If, 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 if in any way, if it, I was thinking of lemons and bitterness. Okay. So yeah. um, bitter talks about temperature or the taste. And um, in thinking about juxtaposition, I would actually be careful about that because if it's too close or too obvious a connection, um, that can weaken the poem. Um, um, I don't know how else to explain that. Um, That's okay. I, it was just a thought. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, you also have lemonade stand seems like a very summery kind of thing and a bitter rain sounds like a winter rain and yeah, you know, yeah. These yeah. are crossed up. But so the woman I, what I was imagining is that there's this lemonade stand and it's just started to rain and it's just gentle and they haven't cleaned up cleaned up the lemonade stand yet. Uh, if it's a pouring rain, you'd think they'd have looked up the weather before they put the lemonade stand up. <laughs> the gentle rain sort of justifies the lemonade stand still being there. That's, that was my thinking. Um, uh, and, and the gentle rain could still work in the summertime. Um, but what to put with it? Um, and I, those of you who have ever been to a workshop of mine before, when I talk about juxtaposition, the example phrase that I love to use is, divorce pending. You can put that with so many things and it amazingly works. Imagine, imagine this poem, divorce pending, a lemonade stand and a gentle rain. It's, it's deeply sad. Um, I mean, you're laughing, but it's deeply sad. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, it is. Uh, it's like the Mad Libs where you put in bed on it or under the covers on everything. That will work with almost anything. Yeah, and and um, actually a few years ago, Paul Miller was our guest at the Seaback Haiku Getaway, and he did a Mad Lib Haiku session, and we reviewed which things worked and which things didn't, <laughs> and it was very helpful to see the to learn the difference. Um, and divorce pending surprisingly works with so. I mean, let's back up here. Divorce pending, the last piece of pecan pie. Uh, <laughs> changes the poem dramatically. Um, and, and you can keep, keep playing with that. It's, it's a useful phrase. But the point of it is to demonstrate the nature of the shift. Um, it is enough of a shifting away, hopefully not too far, and yet not too close. And that was perhaps the issue of bitter with lemonade is too close and that's not necessarily a suggestion for the shifting the the, the, the refrigerator part of the poem um, um, so I get that but um, you want something to find that balance between too far and too close and a metaphor for that is um, relationship of the two parts is like a gap in a spark plug and if that gap is too far it won't fire and it's going to be too obscure and unclear to readers and if it's too close, it'll fire too much and blow the engine, I guess. Um, uh, and it's too obvious. And in, in Japan, there's actually a term, you know, you, you'll dismiss a haiku saying, oh, that's too obvious a connection. Uh, it's it's um, too close. And I wish I could remember the term. Um, but uh, to me, that's the, that's the art of haiku is finding that balance between too far, too close in the juxtaposition. Um, and that's still the hardest thing after 30 plus years of doing haiku. Um, um, I see that Annette has just posted a poem so we can move on from my latest pontification. Um, Annette's poem, persimmons daring each other, 
first sight. Oh, nice. <laughs> um, I, for one, am not a persimmon fan because they're always so sour <laughs> and dangerous to me. Um, um, so I can I can totally relate to this dare uh, in this poem. Well, we had a persimmon in the front yard, and we used to tell kids it was a tomato tree when the persimmon oh, was no. still not ripe, <laughs> and nobody'd seen one because it was the only one north of the Mason Dixon line. <laughs> Another one of my grandmothers, and it was fun to watch them bite those things. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any other thoughts on this poem? I love it. I think it just stands perfectly. Yeah, that's a great poem. I have to leave, but thank you all very much. Okay. Well, thank yeah. you, Mary. Please well. send in your food poems. Uh, <laughs> Yes. Nice to see you, Mary. I'll send a follow-up note to everyone with the place to post your poems, and I hope that you'll all enjoy the pride of ownership and put them out there in the comments on our Art Unbox site. And if you're embarrassed and you don't want to claim them, you can put them up anonymously, and then after you get all the compliments on them, come back and take a bow and post your name. No, well, that's what I'm going to say. It was mine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Michael, I can't thank you enough for what's been a really, really enjoyable evening of, of uh, poetry. And we're very excited to help people in our food program synthesize the deliciousness of the, of the things they can do with the food they're receiving with the beautiful art of appreciating it. And um, we're gonna bring the two closer and closer together. Well, thank you. Uh, I hope this workshop has been inspiring the basics of haiku, but also digging a little deeper with some of our discussion. I'm glad we could uh, get a good taste of food haiku as well. Um, <laughs> I'm, I hope I can come up with uh, a third line for my poem too, besides divorce pending. Um, so thank you all. <laughs> thank you all for being here um, and contributing your poems and your thoughts. Um, Sharon, I know you, you just joined us. Um, I think I had the wrong time. It said starts at seven. Um, yes, but that was oh different no, different time zone. But we did record. We did record the whole thing, so you will get to have the experience. Oh, okay. I can send you the link. I'll have it later today or tomorrow. Okay. Do you have my email? I assume I have it on the sign up form, but if not, put it here in the chat, and I will make sure I have it so I get it to you. Okay. Thank you. So thank you, Gordon, for your comments on the on the chat too. Um, and Annette, I hope uh, this was a rewarding workshop for you. We maybe didn't talk enough about your poem, but uh, I totally love this first bite. It also feels like it's a first date too, um, mm. <laughs> or at least I, that's where my mind went because of the sound of the word bite. Um, uh, I don't know. That's just what I thought of. Um, whether you intended that or not. Um, again, thank you all. Um, the uh, recording, I hope, will be beneficial to others as well. And uh, I, for those of you who are newer to haiku, I hope um, you will catch the haiku bug. We didn't get to the part of my PowerPoint talking about other ways to become a haiku addict, but there are journals to subscribe to and societies to join and local haiku groups you can be part of, depending on where you live and uh, uh, we'll conferences have to have you, you back. go to. <laughs> yes, yes. And, and again, thank you to the Virgilio House for all of its work as a writing center for, for the town and um, for, for making a difference. Uh, I, I live in, near Seattle where we have a writing center and I just love the fact that we have one. So kudos to, to you for, and it's been a long road to make, make it happen. A long road. And, and I love the fact that in this pandemic time that it's expanding its mission even to, to things as necessary as food. Yeah, whoever thought beyond... we'd be giving away food and diapers at the writer's house, but it has become a necessity and we're doing it. Yeah, I yeah, hope, hope you come visit us over there someday, Michael. I hope so. I'd love to, I'd love to do that. I've enjoyed seeing the pictures. Of, uh, I'd love to see some of the uh, of Nick's artifacts too that I know you have there. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. We're, we're fighting to keep them uh, handy <laughs> with our uh, mighty riders. They want more room, more room. But, you know, hey, this is the Nick Virgilio Writer's House. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> thank you all. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you right. and, and good night. Thank you for staying up late if you're on Peace. the East Coast. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, it's time to watch the news, <laughs> which was my first poem. I just have to read this. The news post-election. It's pouring. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I was going to say, I hope we don't get into politics tonight, but that's Imagine. close. That's, that's okay. That one's okay. <laughs> Political haiku. Thank you. And Sharon, I will definitely send you all of this. Yeah, so I put it there in the chat. I hope it shows. I got it. I got it. I have it here. And as soon as I get the recording, I will send it along. Oh, thank you so much. I don't know why it said seven o'clock and I said, well, I'm trying 645. <laughs> oh, sorry. We've had that issue before. We do put Eastern in everything, but we all think of, you know, we all read a time and we file it in our calendar on that time. <laughs> right. On <laughs> Pacific. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. It was nice meeting everyone. Take care. A pleasure. Bye-bye. Good. Good. All right. Good night, everyone. All right. Thank you.